Shifu Scott Grady. Scott Grady is a former Marine, and he does many martial arts styles, so he's a martial arts instructor. So welcome, Shifu Scott Grady. Thank you for having me. And let's just talk about how did you find my channel? I'm always curious how um, instructors find my channel. Well, you know, YouTube's been a very good treasure trove of uh, martial arts content. So as you do your searches and things like that, you know, the algorithms, I guess, go out and say, hey, check this out. You may like it. So I started watching some of them, and I guess I've got more of your more recent ones versus your older ones. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I guess on your older ones, you didn't, like, show yourself. You were just commentating on fights. Mm -hmm. So I've watched several of the different different kinds that you've done. But uh, some recent ones, you did one with Adam Chang. Yeah, that's right. His name, some guy. Um, and then there's been a couple other ones I, I don't know their names off the top. You did one with a Baji guy, and a uh, Chinese martial arts instructor and things like that. So watch some of those. Um, but uh, you do a lot more of the UFC stuff and, and commentating on that. But I've also saw you've gravitated more towards exploring the difference between the sport and the reality of what martial arts is. So that's what's really drawn me in mm -hmm. to your way of interviewing. You've allowed, you've commentated and uh, drawn out good questions, especially the one with Adam Chen was like <laughs> good. Am I saying his name right? I, I, I just, yeah. I mean, I think sure. we just call him Adam Chen, um, uh, which is actually really interesting um so you actually found the fight commentary chats channel before you found the fight commentary breakdowns channel correct wow <laughs> that's awesome i guess the youtube algorithm doing something right <laughs> <laughs> so um, i was going to ask you since um um where's your accent from by the way uh well i'm i was born in uh, delaware maryland area so i grew up on the eastern east coast mm -hmm. uh and then went to the marine corps traveled you know, around from there to California to Okinawa, Japan, and then uh, wound up in North Carolina. That's where I started my law enforcement career. I'm a cop. By wow. the way, by the so um, that's where I started law enforcement and then moved down to Southern Mississippi, the Gulf Coast area. That's good now. Uh, then we moved to Florida, up to Richmond. Now, my wife is a, my wife is the you know, sugar mama. So <laughs> where she goes, we go. <laughs> So uh, that's kind of what's taken me around a lot of the places I've been. But I guess Southern a little bit. Am I, I see. Makes sense. Southern? Yeah, I hear a little Southern in you. I mean, um, I I spent some time in Maryland. So okay. there are people in certain parts of Maryland and in Delaware and Pennsylvania who have this accent, too. So it's like it could be a Southern thing or it could be just like mid-Atlantic. There's kind of a hodgepodge <laughs> of accents, too. Shifu, this is a good time kind of um, for viewers wondering why I wanted to bring Shifu Scott Grady on. He has law enforcement and military experience, so he's pretty qualified to talk about martial arts. So this is why it's so exciting to talk to Scott Grady about this. I'll give you a little bit of my martial arts background. I started mm -hmm. when I was 13 uh, in uh, Delaware. I met a, you know, you watch TV, you watch movies and stuff like that. Everybody's like, oh, I watch Kung Fu, and that's what you wanted to do. You know, there's, throw, like, there's a saying in Okinawa, you can throw a stone and hit a karate master, a karate master. And so in, in some sense, it's like that here in America, you can throw a stone and you hit a, a karate place or whatever. But I never wanted to do karate. I, I, I'm going to speak the way I, I've learned to speak Japanese. So karate, I'll say that. Don't, don't forgive me for the people that say karate. Um, so the, I never wanted to study karate. I wanted to study kung fu and uh, found a, a kung fu teacher named Doug Davis. And uh, he had studied under... Uh, Brian Gray, who was an, he wrote two Iron Palm books. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. Um, he's got some uh, shady background in his illegal activity. Um, he, I think he spent some time in prison for doing stupid stuff. And there's a lot of history in that, but that was not his main teacher. He was, that was his kind of his last teacher who he uh, kind of uh, got his instructorship under and who he kind of called under the Shaolin Song Kung Fu uh, system and it was primarily uh, long fist northern styles and uh, he had a, he'd also had a student that was I guess the neighborhood kid and his name is uh, Denardo Muhammad or Di Hassan Muhammad and uh, so uh, Master Muhammad had trained under uh, Samad Haq 
uh, James Allen and some other people as well and started his own school. So I went after I got promoted to an instructor under Doug, uh, I was like 18 or 19 when that happened. I, I was still always training with uh, Master Muhammad, but then kind of sh- off shot and in, in the military. And then I went to California, uh, met uh, uh, Chris Arnold, uh, who he would, he had studied under Danny Nisanto and a bunch of the other guys back in, in California. So it was been like 29 Palms is where I was stationed. So he lived in uh, Palm Desert. Started training under him uh, and I wanted to learn Wing Chun. He's like, well, why don't I just introduce you to my Wing Chun teacher who was um, Dr. Marinarco. And uh, so I started learning Wing Chun under him and I did that for like two and a half years and then off to uh, Japan. And I was there for a couple of years, uh, found somebody that, because uh, you're in Okinawa, you're like, is there Kung Fu in freaking Japan, you know, you, you, you kind of wonder that because this is back in like the late 90s. So he, you're like, yeah, I know this person. I'll introduce you. So um, I was with my uh, wife at the time. I, I was married to a Japanese lady. She speaks perfect English. So she's like, hey, I found three schools. There's three Chinese schools here. And I'm like, so I'd already been training in martial arts for several years under several different systems. And, you know, you're not going to be able to you know, pull the mystical, magical, let me rise, to elevate chi over, over my eyes. I, I go ahead, I go to the school and, you know, I don't speak very much. I mean, like at this time, it's this knees, but you understand martial arts and you understand what you're looking at. So I'm watching the class and use, and I, after learning under um, uh, Miyahara Sensei, and I'm sorry, I don't, because I'm, in that frame of mind of speaking Jap, well, I throw out Japanese stuff. I'm sorry. Um, so I started training under him, and uh, or before I learned that he had a kind of a system set up. If new people came in, he it kind of like shut down, and we went into this frame, you know, of like show the basics. You know, we're not going to get into a lot of deep stuff, type things, very surface. And his uh, wife. Uh, it was, she was on the Sichuan national team back in the 80s. She's actually uh, a you know, medalist on, in the, their big whatever the heck they do over there when they compete. Um, and she's pretty famous. I didn't – I did a lot of research after the fact because they're like – people are making claims. It's like, okay, let's start fact-checking. But anyway, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that and some conversations I had with other teachers that you know make you go okay I didn't realize this person was who they were you know um so I'm sitting there and I'm watching it was the first place I went I'm watching and he's going they're going through you know the basic kicking and all the basic you know wushu sports style stuff and I'm watching I'm watching so then he starts getting in and he starts doing drills and they're more like pigwa are you familiar with Chinese martial arts so like pigwa style drills and things like that, and I'm watching, and then um, he uh, takes, he's, you know, he's hit, and I'm like, yeah, 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 okay, I get it, so he takes this one guy, and he's talking about, and it's a drill you do, like, you wrap your body, and it's to develop a uh, fudging, some things I'd like to talk about later on, and some of the misconceptions, I'm probably most, the, the most controversial person you have when it talks about MMA, traditional, and what's real, and what's not real, because I've, I've experienced it. And we'll get into that, I guess. Um, so he's sitting here doing these drills and I'm like, and he sits there and he's talking. I have no idea what he's saying, but I'm watching his movement and I could tell that he's like, eh, it looks like he can develop some part. So he takes this guy and, you know, they will sit like this and we'll hit, hit on the back. And it's basically to develop it, to demonstrate fudging your uh, explosive power. And there's many different forms in the way that um, that kinetic energy is, is trans, transferred into the body or deliver or the delivery system of how you're going to deliver it to a person. So he hits let's pause and he, right here. <laughs> let's let's pause right here. Let's get the earbuds on. It's um the okay. sound keeps cutting out. So yeah, let's get the earbuds on. This is this is good. We're recording pre-recording this. So he's like you're you're talking about such great stuff in it. it. Some of the audio keeps cutting off. So want to make sure we get all this. Sure. 
Yeah, so you should be able to change the microphone now. And hopefully this fixes it. There we go. I'm on my my iMac, so. Mm-hmm. Or, Let's see. Okay. Ooh, the, yep, the audio, can... the audio, man, the, these earbuds, I've never had an earbud, but the <laughs> audio is awesome. It's pretty, they're pretty good. Oh, man, so, this changed it back... so well. Wow, dude. Okay, Sorry. Um. so we'll just, um, uh, just, just start with that, like, that, the, that exercise again. Just start talking about that again. Okay, so, you know. so he, he hits him in the back. And he's hitting him with force. You could tell he's using muscle. And the guy just kind of, you could tell it, it, it stunned him a little bit. Like, oh. And then he kind of just relaxed. And it looked like he went like this. I mean, literally, like he touched him. The guy went up on his toes. And you could tell it was not like, oh, I'm acting. Grabbed the top of his head and he winced. Ah! And he didn't like go flying forward. You know, he was like, ah! and I was like, time out. He just disrupted his nervous system by hitting where he hit him in the back. And to hit him like that and to cause that kind of pain, um, we need to talk. <laughs> so that's where our relationship started. And then I started training under him and found out that he was he's very really high, highly skilled. And, uh, and so going back, he, he made some teams. So there's a, his teacher, or he went, he studied in, I'll kind of tell you his background. He studied in um, Wuhan, at Wuhan Physical Education University back in the 80s. Um, it had been like early 80s. And um, apparently his father, how this all happened is when China was kind of opening up that door to start teaching foreigners uh the chinese sports style martial arts to try to you know proliferate their this model of of martial arts throughout the world like we're allowing those foreigners to come in and um so he went there and uh he, one of his teachers and a lot of people actually name this teacher as their teacher but that was just their teacher in college they were like their grandmaster so um, he was like, no, I was a disciple of this. He had, he had 12 disciples that he had throughout his lifetime that he had taught, mar like privately taught martial arts to. I'm like, okay. <laughs> you know what I mean? You're kind of like, yeah, let's check this out. So, uh, you know, you do a lot of checking, you know, a lot of people back at that time, internet wasn't as proliferated as, as it is now and easier to find information. But it was took me a while months and months and months of of reaching out trying to find people that went to wuhan university did you know this guy yeah but then i ran into uh, lu shaolin she used to be the u.s woman's uh, uh wushu coach out of um i don't you know who she is yeah i i, I trained under her okay yeah. so she knows song lee who is his wife and they're like apparently very good friends I didn't know, you know, you don't know. So you, you find these, all these uh, nexuses of, you know, like, oh, okay, you know them. And uh, so I actually, cool story. I went to go train under there. I was coming, I'd come back every year to visit my parents. And because my parents lived in Maryland, um, I went to go train with uh, uh, Shu, uh, uh, Lu Shaolin uh, for uh, like a day or two or day. I went in, my dog is like getting my face here. So uh I went there and uh, so we're doing all the sports stuff and all this, uh, you know, basic training type things. And I'd been training for hours and hours and hours. I was pretty fatigued and uh, I should have known better. I should have stopped training. I'm like, okay, done. I'm, I've had it. I can't go any further. And um, I forget who the girl is. She used to compete back in the, back in the day. She was from Argentina. Um, I can't think of her name. Anita it, maybe. Yeah. Anita. Anita Lopez. That's it. Um, so she was there. And uh, so, you know, you're doing the jump inside crescents and all this stuff. And she's and I'm like, OK, I kind of sit down. I'm like, yeah, I got I got to take a break. She's like, come on, you can do one more because I had kind of messed up one. And I'm like, eh, it's getting a little iffy. Well, I'm like, OK, I'll do one more. So I hit it. I, I planted jump. I didn't get enough air. And when I came down, I came on down on the side of my ankle and I basically uh fractured one of the bones and uh, had a second and a possible third degree tear 
and ligaments and had to drive all the way back to the eastern shore of Maryland. <laughs> and it was on my right foot. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, that, that was one of the, the, so she would probably remember that. He ever mentioned that to her. She would, oh yeah, that guy. <laughs> so uh, that, was, that was just a, a cool little story. But anyway, going back to his teacher, his, his teacher, his name is uh, Wen Jing Ming, not, uh, uh, I'm sorry, not Wen Jing Ming. Um, yeah, Wen Jing Ming. I'm thinking of uh, Yang Jing Ming. Um, so Yang Jing Ming does Long Fist and, and whatnot out of Boston. That's where he was, is, if you're familiar with that. But Wen Jing Ming, uh, come to find out, he was um, one of the people that demonstrated Chinese martial arts in the Berlin Olympics in 1938. He was also the Taiwanese president during that whole separatist movement back in the, the 40s. He was one of his personal bodyguards. So this guy is kind of a le like a legend. And so um, because there's a lot of language that you don't understand in Japan and China, and I don't speak Chinese either. So trying to learn stuff you got to have some some of the stuff in english and i was i called um i actually called uh wen jing ming because i was going to their their publication center and um because i had i wanted to order a book and it was more about the qigong and stuff just to get because he probably describes it and puts it more in a scientific way versus this mystical Cal points at the third moon and I'm going to levitate kind of BS that you hear. So he puts it more in a scientific way. So I, I always gravitate to him to get a, just kind of an understanding of what they're talking about. And uh, so I was just, I, I said, I've got a couple of questions just to ask you off the top of my head. And it was about Qigong. And uh, he goes, well, do you want to ask Dr. Yang? I'm like, uh, yeah. <laughs> so uh, they put him on the phone. And he start, we start talking back and forth, asking my questions. He started asking about my background. So I go through the whole line of my background. So he heard all this, but he was listening at me and not listening to me at the time. And then he goes, who, and then he goes, wait a minute. And he kind of like, who was your teacher's teacher? I said, Wen Jing Ming. And he goes, si it was like dead silence. I was like, hello, you know, uh, uh, Dr. Yang. First things out of his mouth were, you shouldn't know him was like that. And I'm like, uh, and at this time I really didn't know much about him. You know, I knew a little bit and I'm like, uh, okay. He goes, you know, your teacher is like really famous in Chinese martial arts. And he didn't use it like in the sense of like, oh, I'm a flowery hand kind of like this dude, like hurt people. I put a, a so to kind of go back and just, so you think about the Chinese and, you know, what do they do to people that were dissidents and, you know, uh, opposed their their ideology and they shoved them off to camps and killed them or whatever so remember this guy was the the bodyguard to the taiwan emperor the president at that time was part of that attache well when he went back to china they didn't kill him they put him in prison for a little bit and then he started teaching at wuhan university you just don't you just aren't just a nobody that does something like that, you disappear, you know, you wind up disappearing, you wind up dying, but they put him in a prestigious place to teach martial arts or something. So to me, they, he probably, and also him presenting at the Berlin Olympics at that time, you know, he was kind of like a nat in their mind, kind of like a, still a national treasure. They don't want to just off him. I would think, you know, just kind of why didn't they, why didn't they do this and why did they do that? And all the other things that I've, you know, heard about him throughout, you know, from other teachers was like, this dude is pretty, must have been pretty legit. He's dead now. I mean, he died in, I think, 84, 85, something like that. Um, but uh, anyway, that's kind of my martial arts background and what I've trained in. When I trained with Chris, I trained in Kali. Uh, so like grappling and things, uh, this was early on. And shoot fighting was kind of their thing, I guess, at the, the Danny Nosanto Academy. So he taught me shoot fighting and things like that. So it was a good, at that time, just doing the long fist. And I had no exposure to anything else. And so it was really a, a good experience to open my eyes and go, wait a minute, there's more to this story. There's more to this, this journey that, we, that, we're, that we're going on. Um, especially when Chris beat me up with a clothes hanger. Um, 
when I tried to sneak him, kind of a, you know, like, what do you, have? whoa, stop, you know, because he started beating me up using all the collie stuff when I had all well, the pillows hanging. But if you got, uh, you can go ahead and ask us now or if you got anything, like anything about MMA or uh, Celtics. Uh, I mean, the, the first thing that comes to mind is that story. Why would that guy go back to China from Taiwan? Like, what happened there? Family, I would think. Okay. Because he, pro- he was married to um, – oh, I, I, I am terrible with names. Um, it, she's, she's actually really famous, too. Um, mm-hmm. in, um, I'm trying to think of that. The, like, I can see their faces in my, in my head, but I can't think of their names. Mm-hmm. Um, she, she was famous for double broadsword. And uh, she was also one of the presentators in the Berlin Olympics as well. Mm-hmm. Um, Hua is her last name or first name. Hua. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I can't. I can't think of it off the top of my head. Mm-hmm. Um, I know I've played. That somebody had found an old video of her doing uh, her double broadsword, and I actually put that on there. Uh, I met a. Uh, I had, so my teacher learned kind of go kind of digress a little bit back, and then we'll go back because when you when you when you brought that up. So Wen Jingming did a particular style of Chinese martial arts called Kao Shao Fang Zi. Mm-hmm. So it means, I guess, fighting with cuffed hands. And he wrote a, he actually wrote a book on it. And um, forgive me, I'm my son is here. Allergy season here. Mm-hmm. Um, and he wrote a book on it. And uh, so it's a very obscure, when I say obscure, not a, he didn't teach a lot of people this style of martial arts. So it's a, it, like we look at Da Fanzu, um, the big style, which you're used to seeing, uh, you know, uh, uh, where they're going like that. And that would be Da, da Fanzu uh, or the big frame. And then he did would be like Shao, uh, small frame. But the, the Shao that it's using, because my dialects are very terrible, would be hand, cuffed hand, Shao, uh, Kao Shao Fanzu. Um, but the, the idea of what the, the Fanzu meant was to like the way my teacher told me was like uh, if you look at firecrackers that are on a string they kind of like a uh, chain fist and wing chun kind of that's that that mentality once i touch my my pressure is forward i i'm not going back i'm either going to go forward or go around you you know that kind of thinking um so that's like when fanzi in the in a traditional sense that's what that means um, the way he just described to me, but he does that obscure style. And so he didn't teach me very many people. So again, during my research of trying to find people linked to, uh, my teacher's teacher and all that stuff, I, I came up to, uh, came across, um, Daniel, uh, Pacino out of uh, Chicago. And, uh, he, um, kind of give you a background on him. His brother, uh, Carlos is, was like either is, or still what he was at the time, one of the lead games designers for vision for um, Mortal Kombat and so uh, a lot of action captures for like uh, Johnny Cage, Sub-Zero, uh, Scorpion is actually uh, Daniel uh, and Daniel would also I think he did some uh, stunt stuff for the Turtles the Ninja stuff anyway met him I'd, I'd already moved back to the states in uh, 2002 this is about 2003 uh, time frame I'd, I'd come across him uh, hey, man, I'd love to come out and train with these. Like, come on. I stayed at, you know, went over for a weekend, stayed with him because he actually knew uh, Cal Shalfonso. So um, it was good to see that and, you know, experience it. And so he kind of telling me some of the stories because his teacher apparently uh, was friends with Win Jingming. So that was kind of a, a cool little, cool little thing. But um, I don't know how I got off on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. What's interesting, I'm looking at I'm looking at his bio on Chinese sites and it doesn't even mention any Taiwan thing. <laughs> I love it. I love it. It's a yeah, it's classic, classic. But it's really interesting to hear that part of it. The the part that like if someone just looks at his Chinese bio, they wouldn't see Oh, Winji Ming. Yeah. So interesting. Well. Anyways, um well let's let's talk more about so um you know you were a marine and you were a cop let's let's talk about the realities of self-defense and fighting there i think that's where a lot of people would love to hear your experiences because yeah so just let's let's talk about it like for example being a cop 
Do you have to use any kind of like Qingna holds or anything like that? Yeah. Or, you know, I'm sure with all the controversies these past five years with cops, and <laughs> quote unquote, too much force and stuff. And now it's like, you know, defund the police, all that stuff. I'm not going to get into that stuff. But the point is, tell me about your experience being a cop and the martial arts training that most cops have, et cetera. So I have found because of my, my this goes back to my training um, and the like training with Master Muhammad and training with uh, um, Seabock Davis, that we always, and this is, goes back to you, so you hear these terms today, oh, it's not pressure tested, um, you know, it doesn't work in the street or whatever, these things that you're taught. And so when we go back and we're looking at martial arts, what they were really developed for, you know, first of all, we don't live in a feudal time. I'm sorry, we live in pretty safe streets and pretty safe areas. So when this stuff is de developed, it was developed in a feudal time. And the mindset of a person during that time was head on a swivel, don't know when you're going to get attacked. Uh, so and if and anybody can be club punched or snuck, if you know what I'm saying. So when that happens, I don't care what you know. I don't care if you got a gun. Guess what? If you get if you get clocked and your bell gets rung, it's going to take you a couple seconds to recover, regroup and get back into the fight. That's reality. So when these martial arts were developed, that going back to what they really are, I had very good teachers, blessed, totally blessed to have good teachers in my life to do these things. And so we were doing things like pressure testing. We weren't calling it pressure testing. We made up all kinds of other names for them. But, you know, when you have, you know, four or five people surrounding you, you're in the center and you're blindfolded, spun around in a circle. And then all of a sudden, each one of these people have a number and you get the hoodwinks yanked off of you and your teacher yells out two numbers and you don't know where they're coming from. And all of a sudden you get bum rush tackled, swung at, and you got a deal. That's a pressure test in and of itself to put it in the most realistic frame that you can put it in, in a training environment that's uh, safe enough that you can survive it but dangerous enough that it has that real type oh shit factor. So when we go into law enforcement and things, one of the things I have found uh, through my, I guess my training in reality, once, you know, like you're under arrest, it's happening. There's nothing you're going to do to stop this. Um, in the physical form of it, the moment my hands on them, I think they feel that energy and know that this is not going to go well for them if they resist. I've had some resist, but after a few seconds, I call it the snuggle struggle. You know, you get into that kind of it where you're actually uh, trying to hold them or pull, hold them in a china or something like that. And then they feel that pressure. They're like, oh shit, that hurts. Uh, okay, I'm not going to resist. I'm going to do that kind of passive active resisting versus, you know, actually snatching away from you and like, let's go. Because they, they realize that I'm not just dealing with just average Joe Blow cop. I'm dealing with somebody who may know a little bit more. I think that you project that kind of energy um, to people and you let them know that this is this is for real. This is not a joke. That it, it, things change, you know, in their mindset. And so, in my experience, I've not had anybody like full out swing on me. One because I I'm always putting you know because the way I'm I'm trained mentally is I'm never going to put myself to the best of my human ability in a position to allow you the, the, the distance, the position to be able to sneak me. Plus I'm watching your body language. The moment that, that I see that shoulder flinch in the wrong way, I can, I can articulate why I slammed your ass on the ground because I knew what your behavior was doing. I can describe it from beginning to end by describing your body language. And that's part of, the things that I was taught as a martial artist, we taught that kind of things. And I, I think I wanted to talk, actually talk about that. So learning in, in, in the different countries that I was able to go to, you know, I've learned here in America, I, I learned in Japan, I, I went to China twice and, and learning and, and seeing things there. And what you see, you know, the best way I can describe it, the worst thing for martial arts in America has been civil liability. Think about it. So if you look at the martial arts of the 70s, early 80s, uh, people like, what's, what's pads? You know, well, oh, oh, you put them things on? That We don't do that. Of the way they used to train, 
and the stories that your teachers would tell to what you see today, you got to put your kid in a bubble suit for him to spar. And then when he hits little Johnny and walk, knocks, okay, stop, apologize to little Johnny. You know, that's been the, because the teachers are afraid to get, they're getting, they got sued because little Johnny got knocked down and, you know, whatever. I think, so in my opinion, that's been the worst thing for the development of martial arts on a broader scale in the United States. You know, you, so you don't get, so you get all these people that are learning in these um, Mac Dojo, you know, mill martial art things that aren't really being taught real martial arts or the real science behind it of how to develop your mind, you know, how to develop, you know, when you're walking, are you doing that? that peripheral scan to know that situational awareness, you know, terms that we know today because of the development of the warrior culture within America through law enforcement, the military and things like that. So a lot of this stuff is, is coming out now. And so this is going to be my controversial statement. So now you have this push of MMA and the Gracies when they try to dominate a very closed controlled environment to say, we're doing the best thing in the world. You can't defeat me. Well, if I'm a football player and you hand me a bat and tell me to play baseball and I've never played baseball in my life, maybe at a disadvantage. So when you're looking at the Gracies and, and Kim Shamrock, uh, whom I've met, he, he put it in one of his interviews plainly. They extended the fight because he was winning. And they knew... It, they knew that, and that wasn't part of what the agreement was. And he, he wound up losing because he, he was fatigued. He'd already fought like one or two matches. Gracie's coming in pretty much fresh and he's dominating Gracie. So, oh no, extra round. We need to go an extra round knowing that he would be fatigued. Because again, this is a sport. This isn't, nobody's getting poked in the eye, chopped in the throat. They're not snapping, you know, pinky fingers off. You know, they're not Mike Tyson in the ear. This isn't reality. What martial arts was developed for, it's a sport. And it is a sport. And, it, and it, I'm not trying to say that these people aren't effective in their sport or if they were accosted on the street to be able to defend themselves because getting punched in the face is getting punched in the face. It, it, you know, it, it doesn't it doesn't matter. It, it's still going to hurt and have a, some level of stopping somebody. But when we get into the, the martial arts part of it or the and, the, and I, I, I use that word because it's more broad, the term used, but it's more of a martial science. And, and again, we, we go back to when this stuff was developed, how it was passed down in all the different cultures from China to Japan to Indonesia and who they taught. You know, it, it started out as, you know, small, small nuclear family circles. And then it got broader and broader as, as time went on for whatever situation, whether it would have been uh, wars, uh, it had been, uh, you know, civil unrest in that area where we had to teach people. Like if you were looking at, say there was mass civil unrest, the sheriff can go and deputize, you know, hundreds of people. You are now, they are blessed. Here's a badge and gun. You help hold the line. So in that sense, when you're looking at other cultures, they're going to do the same thing. You know, they're going to, they, they think that's universal throughout the world in the, in the, in the thinking of man. So um, I, I really think that uh, what happened early on and the Gracies are to blame for it is the degradation and the belief that martial arts is or the traditional martial arts are ineffective. I don't I don't agree with that. I think what you have is a lot of traditional martial arts that teach traditional martial arts have lost um, their understanding of what it is they're learning because again we don't live in a feudal time we don't live in a time where you got to look over your back 24 7 you're walking with a sword down the street you know you're, you're going to be robbed or, or something like that i mean these things can happen but there it's it's a lot less frequent or, or not less less infrequent than it would have probably been in those days so and then you got to look at why these were developed uh so i read i i was you know doing on facebook and i came across it, Pretty interesting that came across us today. Nothing by chance, right? So, and this is what it said: If your old martial, if your old style of martial art does not work, then you do not understand it. An old style exists today because the practitioners did not die. 
think about it. So if you're, if you have these people that are able to, you know, teach this stuff and it gets passed down, passed down, passed down, I think throughout, because again, I don't believe when I look at traditional and I use that word, I don't use it in a sense of if you teach me to punch this way, that's the only way I can punch. That's not what I mean. Um, because things will change and develop as my body. So I'm not Asian. So you are Mabu for, for instance. So if you look at me sitting in Mabu, I have a big butt. It looks like my butt's curved. So, you know, oh, back must be straight. Well, Again, then we look at my hips. I don't have the same hip structure as an Asian. Not, I'm just not. I'm not structured the same with my limb length and all that stuff. So I have to adapt that stance for my body to work. I, ca I can't conform myself to something that doesn't work for my body. You know, so I, I think a lot of this has been uh, because it, like in Japan. Um, so when I was leaving at that time in 2002, uh, Ishinru was, was going through a basically a like everybody needs to get their shit together uh, so we can be considered a traditional uh, Okinawan martial arts because it's not considered to be at that time it was a, a, um, a hodgepodge more or less it, it was a, um, a hybrid system because it, it had uh, Shodanru and Gojinru as put together to form a style so and that's what Ishinru was and so there is basically, there were two teachers, there's three, the one third teacher, I don't even really want to mention him. I don't, anyway. Um, there were two teachers. One guy was basically sending out his, um, his right-hand man, more or less, throughout the world. Like, if you are doing anything different in the katas than the way that we're doing them at the Hamu Dojo, then uh, you can either remove the name Ishinru or our name from your style or you get your shit together because they were getting ready because uh there's uh the budokan it's kind of like the repository for okinawa martial arts in okinawa they kind of um if you're in naha and you're looking at it from the sky it looks like a big samurai helmet the actual place and um so when they would line up when they would go to the tournaments at the uh, at the budokan they would always line up under shonru because their main style was was shonru karate and they had other, they, they brought in uh, Gojo no Karate, some of their forms or their katas to, to, I guess, express what they wanted to do as martial arts. So at that time, uh, there was that going on. And I forgot how I got on this. I, I, I digress. Yeah, um, I let's just try to focus. Like it's, okay. it's, I understand you have a lot to talk about, but too many tangents man yeah. so i'll go into what we were trying to talk about which was let's talk about streets versus sports okay. so that's one of the things you were mentioning before we went on all these tangents so i totally agree with you on that especially about the gracies and i love jujitsu but some of the stuff on some of their channels cringes me out so much and i remember this one video on my Discord server, I talked about it. I talked about it with other jujitsu guys, and a lot of them agreed with me. It was this, it happened in New York. This guy took some dude who looked like he was about to attack him, took him down into the middle of the street and grappled him, out grappled him. But then they were celebrating, like, oh my God, look at that as a demonstration of jujitsu. But it's like, think about it another way. You're doing jujitsu in the middle of the street. It's on concrete. Someone could have come up behind you, kicked you. A car could have ran over you. Exactly. And in my mind, I'm like, I I understand that jujitsu is effective, but are you guys gonna try to sell this to your practitioners? Yeah, dude. The oh, best source of self defense when it's someone attacking you on the street is just to like take them to the ground in the middle of the street. That that upset me. I'm still upset about that, right? And like, so going back to what you said. I love what you said about how a lot of these styles, not all of them, I will say the power of human delusion is very powerful. It can pass down many generations, but a lot of these styles probably existed because they did work back in the day. I'm not going to say all of them, but a lot of these styles probably did exist. So I love what you said, Scott, about you got to look at the context, you know, yeah. was it being exactly. taught because people are using spears to fight? You know, was it being taught because people are sitting on horses to fight? Like, you got to think about all that, Pudau. right? Well, and, like, when you look at the Pudau form, for instance, it, the horse cutter, what was it used for? To cut horses' legs off, you know? 
So, but you look at a, a form today and it's this elaborate, I'm going to flick it around and all that, like, um, no, it was used to cut off horse legs. So let's practice how we chop, how we're going to hold it. So when the horse is running or up rears, how I'm going to attack the horse, but yeah. going back to the street, because I think you wanted to stay there. Um, so for instance, as a cop, they, they're selling the law enforcement Gracie system of this is the best to be all the end all for law enforcement. And I think to myself, Hmm, I've got a bulletproof vest on that constricts my contraction and flexion of my torso. I'm wearing a belt that's got several different things on it that in and of itself is probably in the weight of about 20 to 15 to 20 pounds. And I'm going to grab someone, go to a guard position. Now, if I had to in a life-threatening situation, first of all, we'll talk about that in a second. I'm going to go to a guard position with all this shit on my back and expect it not to hurt me. Give me pain because what is pain going to do? It's going to reduce my ability to be able to think. And all of a sudden, you that, that OODA loop that we're trying to stay in gets interrupted. And it gives that person an advantage who is more has more freedom of movement because he's not constricted by all the shit he's wearing. So uh, when, we're, when we're looking at it, it's just not practical. And I have found I've never – going to the ground taking some now have i taken and th- throw hit thrown somebody and slammed him on the ground mm-hmm. but i'm in a dominating position i've allowed myself to be there because ultimately i've got to get them in that position to cuff them to get them under control so um when you're when you're looking at that in a, in a real type sense yeah i, I don't want to be on the ground here you go most people don't fight alone Most people have a buddy around. So here I am, cop on the ground in a situation. Let's look at riots and stuff going on. And I mount somebody and I'm trying to get you and manipulate you. First of all, now I got to get you in a, in a, in a prone position versus a spine position to handcuff you. And here I am flipping you around and here comes his buddy with a club punch. Reality. So now we look at the reality. I'm fighting for my life, right? Someone's gone for my gun. I'm to the point where I'm going to the group. This guy's fighting. We're not talking about he is actively resisting trying to get away. He is actively fighting me. That changes the game. Me punching you in the face as a cop, totally okay. I can justify why I punched you in the face because you're punching me in the face. Right? I got to stop you. I'm not trying to kill you. I'm trying to stop you. So with me trying to stop you, I can use whatever means necessary to stop you. And that's what the law says. So when we start looking at this in a reality based type thinking, I don't want to be on the ground. I don't, I'll take it to the ground, but in a, I'm going to be in a dominating position to where I'm over you. Then I've also got the cavalry who's either a on their way or already there to help me put you in handcuffs. Yeah. So that's another way of outthinking your opponent. You know, yeah. we don't you, fight alone either. You mentioned so, such great points that I think a lot of people who maybe train in this, what, what is now the standard kind of martial arts curriculum don't think about, which is one, most cops have a buddy, right? Most cops also aren't patrolling alone, right? Mm-hmm. So like, take that into <clears throat> account. The other thing I love what you said is, let's say you're a cop with a bulletproof vest or something that adds weight. What it also adds is that it adds extra handles for people to grab too, <laughs> right? Because, you know, the bulletproof vest isn't like some skin tight thing. It's People can grab onto various things. So these are all things that people need to think about that yes. if you just take the standard um, curriculum, oh yeah, jujitsu will solve 90% of your problems. It's too simple. And yeah. um, th- there's certain greasy combative stuff that's all about like oh knife defense and all that stuff i'm like there's no way any of that's gonna work you know the, some of their jujitsu knife stuff is so cringe and again i love jujitsu i love jujitsu but with anything no matter how effective you have to understand there's limits right there's always limits to things and my fear is with a lot of jujitsu because um it seems to be so effective in one one situations is people get deluded about its use when it's not a controlled one-on-one situation it's- a controlled controlled yeah. environment so one of the things that like uh, i know you like xiaodong um what's that guy's name Xu Xiaodong. Have, that guy, yeah so i've watched his things and he's never fought anybody of any caliber when i watch him i'm like yeah that guy's a joke 
that Tai Chi guy is a joke. Oh, that Wing Chun guy. Yeah, right. His Wing Chun's not that, he's not that high level of a skill, but you don't see him like, I want to challenge this Kung Fu guy who has actually fought and is pretty more, a little more famous in the realm of, I do the real thing and not this, I am just trying to show and get students, me and proliferate this in my, it's about them, that martial arts teacher versus like, I've never saw Adam Chang until I watched your video. I love what he said. It's a, you know, martial arts is a tree. You know, what do you want to make out of it? You want to make a chair? You want to make a table? Probably one of the best ways of it being said. And that's what it really is. So when you're looking at the actual, how does this stuff work? And I go back to that. Um, you know, we, we go back to what's taught today and in, in a controlled environment. So he's never really fought anybody of any caliber of, of Chinese martial arts. Said I'm, I'm strictly Chinese martial arts. I've been doing long fists for 20 years um, because I'll fight him, but I'm not fighting your rules. I'll fight him, but I'm not going to fight your rules. So when I go back to your eyes, I don't want to hear your shit because we're, we're, we're fighting. I'm fighting to win, not fighting to uh, win some trophy. I'm, I'm fighting to defeat you. That's why we're here. And if you want to put rules on it, well, then I'm out because that's not how I train. Again, if I'm a football player to go play baseball, you know, it, it, it's, you gotta, you gotta train in that. And I've actually, I fought in uh, K1 uh, style kickboxing in Japan. And I did that because not for the fact of going to, I want to be a K1, you know, champion one day. Cause I want to fight, you know, one of them guys, them guys have cleaned my clock because I'm fighting in their, their arena. I just want, I want to be in an environment where, someone's really trying to take my block off and what that pressure feels like to be able to think under that pressure and to be able to deal with it. So that's why I did it. And even the, um, the son, the son stuff was more, I want to, you know, someone actually coming at me and trying to hurt me. How can I deal with it? So I put myself in that box and I trained for that box at that time, but that's not the primary of my training. You know, my training is, uh, so a lot of times I see like Wing Chun seems to be the big thing, you know, the can Wing Chun work in the ring? Well, I don't think it can, because if you look at the primary attacks of Wing Chun, where are they attacking? The neck. So when you're using the Mok Jung and I'm coming up for an attack, that attack is not meant to hit you up the side of your chin. It's meant to hit you in this area, your brachial plexus into your carotid arteries. Those things do real damage. Why do you think you can't hit in those areas in UFC? Because they do real damage and they can hurt you and kill you. They, long, you know, you get hit in the carotid artery and two hours later you're dying because you had an internal bleeding. And you didn't know about it because it got it got uh, punctured or ruptured from the strike. So you know, so when you take those tools away from a Wing Chun guy and all he's got is chain punch, you know, he can't you know hit you in the side of the neck. He, he, you know, can't hit you in the growing. He can't, you know, do his buji to the eye. That, that takes a whole total, uh, takes their tools away. So, of course, they're not going to be able to deal with your thing because now they've got to rethink because they've not trained. Let me train for fighting. You have the other guy who's a Wing Chun guy that I saw. You talk about one of the fight commentaries, that Wing Chun guy that's actually pressure testing his Wing Chun in, in the more of the UFC. I don't know his name off the top of my head. Um, you've talked about him a lot. You're talking about Silala? Yes. That's also, it. just just a clarification. I don't cover UFC. So just for viewers watching oh, on Fight Commentary, okay, I don't cover UFC. So I know I um, Scott mentioned it, but um, I mean, I cover stuff that that is more underground, but I don't cover UFC. So UFC, if you want me to cover your stuff, please let no, me know. No, no, no. But I'm, UFC, I'm just, I've used that as a, cool. as a reference, as a the kind of the frame and I, I i i i get where you're coming from i'm just using that as the as a point of reference for i guess viewers or whoever to know what i'm talking about the ring you're fighting in a ring you're fighting under rules and you typically it's a mixed martial arts style or what they call a mixed martial arts style of fighting where we're going to do you know striking and grappling and it's all allowed so i apologize 
No, it's all good. It's all good. I just, the UFC has issues. You know, they don't, they're not good with fair use. So that's why I don't cover them. Oh, so. I apologize. Yeah. I no, it's all good. I would in. love to cover them, but I'm honestly rooting for, I think there's other kind of big talent agencies that are going to, in the future, come up with probably rival organizations or rival leagues. So I've seen I think I'll get on that them. eventually. But as of now, I think everyone has issues with UFC. So, so what do you think about the, I guess they were, they were scheduled to fight. Um, the first guy you mentioned, the Shudong, Shudong, what's his name? Xiaodong. The guy from China. Yeah, mm-hmm. say it again. Xu Xiaodong. Xu Xiaodong fighting DY. The, oh, DKU? Guy. Yeah, DKU. It's not going to happen. I already covered that on my channel. It's not going to happen. Oh, really? Yeah. Ah. So if viewers haven't seen that, watch that. But okay. um, th- there was something I wanted to mention too from what you said earlier, which is such an important thing. And um. I see this happening not just in traditional martial arts, but, you know, the quote-unquote modern, quote-unquote tests in martial arts too. And it's that they don't appreciate that people's bodies are different. It's mm. something, it's one of my pet peeves too. I'm like, we mentioned it about traditional martial arts, but like, I think a lot of um, even jujitsu schools and stuff, they kind of forget <clears throat> that. Like some dude who's just a very stocky dude who can push someone off is very different from some guy who's some guy or girl whose legs are very long can do different things, right? And I think that's part of a problem in general with how martial arts are trained is that it's like my way's the best or my way works or train him. It's like no, you gotta you gotta let the student figure it out. What's what? things are best for him or her and i think that's what really gets a lot of this a lot of styles that's what prevents the students from progressing too much it makes them plateau too much is that whether the students themselves believe or the instructors make them believe that there's this way this way this is these are the moves but it's like maybe it doesn't work for the student's body Mm -hmm. and that's something you mentioned that and i thought that was such a brilliant thing we got to highlight more and that's what I think prevents a lot of people from continuing in their martial arts journey. You know, why can't I do this combo? Maybe your body just moves a different way. Maybe you need to learn other combos. You know, why can't I do this choke? Maybe your legs don't work that way. You know, it's like, <laughs> these are these are things totally worth mentioning. And even going back to like training cops and all that, maybe some cops, like you said, they carry extra equipment. Maybe this cop actually is the one that carries a shotgun, you know, so he doesn't just have a pistol in his holster. You know, these are all things to think about. And then a lot of these trainings are too broad or they're, they're too unfocused for the, the specific person. And so that's actually a conversation itself that we might have to get into another talk, but it's like, how do you make it? So, you know, I want everyone to be able to have their ability to defend themselves, right? But we all know a lot of these self-defense things don't work. So how do you make it so everyone can like actually be able to defend themselves somehow? So uh, that's interesting. So like Mia Hada sensei and even my other teachers, but I'll highlight him is so there, the, there, you have a style and a system, and they're two different things. So we look at uh, Craig Manners from Long Chen would be a style. So if we look at um, a traditional style, either in the southern the southern styles, there it's all a certain way. There's nothing different about it. They have three, four forms. Wing Chun, for example, three forms. It, it's this ch- ch- box, and you're in it, right? So that would be a a style then you have a system so i mentioned um, um Ishinru is a system so they took one style and another style and blended them to express whoever i can't i don't know i'm don't not a big japanese martial arts guy but the person that developed Ishinru decided to because he learned this and learned this to put these together to express what he wanted to express as a martial arts so when we look at this on the why, I don't know why he's dead. We, no one ever asked that question of why you did it. And maybe did, did. I, don't, I just don't know why. Um, but my teacher, we don't learn just long fist. We learned long fist, Baji Tren, Pigua, you know, these different things because it's, he, his thing was in, in Sa Tren. Like, why would I teach you a whole system of Sa Tren when I could teach you one form of Sa Tren and it embraces pretty much everything about that style and it will teach you what I want you to learn from that style, you know, because like, if you look at long fist, a traditional long, a long fist in of itself is even not, it's a newer 
uh, form of martial arts. It was developed what, in the 50s or whatever it was, or 40s, post uh, or right around the Cultural Revolution. Um, so when we look at that, it's not really traditional. It's a it's a out you know a hodgepodge of you know four or five different styles, and one of them being Sa Chuen. And so uh, Sir Lu Sa Chuen, the fourth set in that traditional system, I'm sorry, style of mar- of martial arts or Chinese martial arts, has pretty much what they would consider to be the kind of like it embraces the whole style. And so he would teach you these different these different things. So we learn some i call them the the fufu forms the so the first couple forms we learned were the um the dern system uh, long fist forms taught by um that you pretty much learn it's like if you learn first dance dern or whatever it is in the chinese uh if you're going to do it go the sports route these are like the traditional forms per se that they teach you so we learn those but then it's immediately to sa trend and so an uh, interesting thing so I'm doing this Sa Trin form for Shu, Lu Shaolin. And she goes, wow, that's old. I was like, huh? What do you mean? She's like, they don't even do it like that anymore. I'm like, what do you mean old? So, you know, doing some research, it finds out like, yeah, it's very old. It, it, it's still the original, the way my, whoever taught my teacher it, which was uh, actually taught it, uh, was um, Wen Jingming's wife taught him this style. Of uh, or this particular form of um, uh, the uh, of Satchuan, that fourth road. So then it's into Baji, and he had a friend that um, his teacher was a friend of his teacher sent him to to learn Baji, and uh, because it was like, hey, my teacher was like, teach me, teach me, and and apparently Wen Jingming was like, no, 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 here, no, I'm not going to teach you. Go learn from this guy. Go learn from this guy. And what he was doing was actually trying to get a good frame for him. Now you can come with me. I don't have to deal with all the beginner bullshit, <laughs> you know, to teach him, you know, to teach him what he wanted to teach him. So um, luckily for my teacher, uh, he, the Baji, he learned a uh, big, a small frame and big frame. And then also the spear from this particular teacher of Baji. So that was a real interesting thing. The guy you had on about Baji, that was a pretty interesting uh, thing. And that's like getting into the fajings and stuff like that. But um, so to get back to it, so doing this allows the allowed him to, hey, what's going to best work for you? What's going to best work for you? So my frame, like even learning Baji and I'm I'm good at doing it. When you look at me doing it, it's like, hey, that looks like a club food of baboon walking, you know, because of my frame. I'm just a tall, big guy. So getting in those low stances just doesn't work as well for me i have to modify the stance so to to work for me but it was something that he didn't like oh no you have to be you know what i mean he would make me sit low for strengthening the legs but it had the purpose of that's what it's for it's not really for you to fight somebody at that level i realize you're almost six foot tall and all of us are you know five foot four you know so you got to adapt this to make it work for you um and so i i i believe that a good teacher will do that and again that's also going back to my other teachers as well is we would we would do things like that. So I totally agree that that's something that's lost in 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 a, especially Japanese martial arts. So there's a friend of mine named Wade Croniger who I met over there. He'd been living over there for ten years. American. Uh, he was featured on the Discovery Channel back uh, I'd say the early 2000s. It would have been like 2000 2001 or maybe 99 somewhere in that time frame. Uh, the Discovery Channel came over to Okinawa and they were featuring the Okinawa martial arts and they needed somebody who was who had influence in the community, the mar- that martial arts community, but also spoke English. And Wade had been living there for 10 years and he was training under um, Miyagi, Miyagi? Um, I can't think of the guy's name. Pretty famous guy. Um, and I'll tell you a story about him. It's like some, when EF Hutt, when EF Hutton speaks, people listen kind of a thing. Um, so they came to, they took him and he was actually the one that he took them to all the different Okinawan teachers. Cause his, he had the in to be able to get in those doors that possibly people wouldn't be able to get into. And, uh, he studied, uh, uh, Mebu, um, Mebu Khan, uh, Gojinryu. Um, and then they also featured his teacher on there as well. So, um, how do I get into that? Sorry. Got off on a tangent again. A lot of stories. <laughs>
but it, that oh, the, how it how it's in a box. So when you get these styles out there, and you, especially in Okinawa, they don't. Um, you, I can't change it. You can't change. You must punch this way. You must be this way. And uh, so going to um, this particular teacher that my teacher had met over there, who actually he's a, a he's a ninth degree black belt. So he was pretty old, you know, he's, he's dead now. He was one of those guys that everybody respected. No one would ever disrespect him in his face. Um, give you a short story about him to kind of tell you how old he was. Uh, back in probably been the fifties had been, you know, post-World War II type frame. Uh, he was going into one of the local bodegos or whatever the izakaya or whatever the heck they are shops in Okinawa to get a drink. And there was a local uh, gang. He, he, he used the word Yakuza when I asked him about the story, but it's not the Yakuza tattoo. Yakuza to them is just gang. So it was a local gang basically uh, extorting one of the shopkeeper for some money. And there was a couple of them in there. It was like the story is there was like five of these guys in there. And they had knives. And uh, so I'm telling you the story before I find out about the story. And he apparently put these dudes in the hospital, beat them badly. And uh, he has these scars on his forearms. I didn't know what they were from. I, he had told me he had worked in the shops during World War II. And I figured he had machine. They were, you know, hey, I got injured by a machine or something, fell on my arm or some stupid shit. So this goes back to uh, Wade Croninger. He goes, because we would go up every um, Saturday night and uh, train with him, my teacher and his teacher, because of what he was doing. And uh, so he goes, hey, um, you're training at this place. Is he kind of an eccentric guy? I'm like, yeah, but there's another a way out of Sensei that's eccentric, too, that does Gojinru. I think you're talking about him. Uh look at him and if he's got scars on his forearms, he's this guy. He goes, ask him how he got the scars. I'm like, you're setting me up. I know you're setting me up. So I, I go and I'm this one day I'm looking at his arm. I'm just kind of like staring at his arms and he sees me and he's like, not even what are you looking at? I'm like, the arms. He goes, ah, long story. So I'm like, tell me, uh, fight some people, had knives. Uh, didn't go good. I'm like, so then I'm like, then I go back to Wade and I said, all right, tell me the story because he's not coming off of it. That's just the kind of guy this dude was. He was, he didn't talk about his, his exploits and shit. He, 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 he was who he was, if you know what I mean. He was that kind of a guy. So um, he told me the story and I was like, oh my God, you come to find out like, yeah, this, this guy. Um, so he was like the black sheep because what he did to Gojinru kind of like shook up the world, uh, their world. He started going because he met my teacher and the way he described the relationship with my teacher. He says, this is the first person I've ever been able to talk about martial arts that knew what the hell he was talking about. And so that was like, what? And he was telling that about my teacher. So what he started doing is researching the roots of these techniques and how they actually work. So when we look at this particular technique that they'll do in some of their, their katas and they they say, oh, it it is this and my teacher's like try it i'm gonna punch at you see if it works oh shit it doesn't work you're pushing against my body and i have a force coming in what damage are you doing how are you pushing me off it, it's not working correctly it's not that the technique is wrong it's your understanding of it is wrong and so that woke up um uh uh Oyahata sensei to make him go and start changing things. And so this, I can't change form thing started in him actually re-looking at the system and starting to change some of the techniques in the uh, actual applications of what they are too. And also in the, um, the, the, the weapons, cause he was a, a weapon, cause they, the, the way they have it separated over there is you have the empty hand and you have the weapons. So they're, they are, can be taught separately. A lot of, you know, senseis learn the weapons as well, the Okinawan weapons, but they're separate things. So you can be a, a master in this and not be a master in this, but he was a master in, in both. And um, so he started redeveloping them to the point to where he was like the black sheep. 
they would never disrespect him to his face, but they'd talk about him behind his back. You know, oh, he's he's disrespecting the art. You know, he's changing things. How dare he? But he was willing to go, wait a minute, this isn't working. And so we used a term, um, I don't know I'm talking about Okinawan martial arts, but I would think this is a lot to do with martial arts to general today, because you would see this, like I was talking about before, that as we get this civil liability, we don't live in a feudal time, people having these uh, martial art mills, you know, to make themselves, you know, I am a famous master. Look at me. I've got 3000 students, whatever that you know reason is um, to go, wait a minute, if this stuff isn't working or isn't what I thought it was then what is it? Um, and also going back to what started to, to allow me to see this with more open eyes, even when I went over there, was uh, when I trained under uh, Chris Arnold, who tra- was the guy who trained under Danny Nasanto in, in, in the Danny Nasanto Academy. He showed, he was talking about um, a Weiche, uh, I, I don't think it was a Weiche Ru or some Okinawan style. And he was, because he was, because he had started studying Southern style praying mantis. And he talked about that caving of the chest, you know, how the structure in the body allows you to be able to keep and have that structure. Also, kind of, if you look at Wing Chun, Wing Chun doesn't do this. They have that more sunk chest and, and keeping this for that structure. It helps the, the form the structure, to the, the, that uncommon force. And so he showed me some old uh, videos of some like black and white that style footage of some old uh, karate masters where they were doing san chin and they were keeping their chest sunk they weren't doing it the way they do today where they kind of puff that chest out so you have this whoever decided to teach this for whatever reason now you have it lost why are you doing this when you can have old old ways of them doing it when they did this and why did they do that and are they being tight or are they being loose you know, because uh, the more you tense up, the more you lose that that uh, kinetic energy, your ability to be able to generate that kinetic energy. You, you can't flow free, freely. So I think when you when you look at that as a whole in martial arts, we, there's this loss in translation, this loss on how these techniques really work. So I, I would totally agree with what you were saying. Sorry. Long um, I think I'm going to stop the interview now. I just, we need to, let's do another interview soon. I need to figure out how to focus this because like, I know if I put That's this up, it's going to lose viewers. Kind of pre-interview type stuff. Yeah. Um, no, I'm so I'll have to, I'll have to figure it out next time because it just, um, normally when I talk with people I interview, we can just flow, but I just know this is, this is just going to lose viewers. So, um, what I'll do is I'll see if I can edit this into something, but, um, very likely we'll have to do another one. Maybe we'll come up with like three topics and just stick to them. There you go. So we'll, we'll do it another time. I just, um, like one of the things as an interviewer, sometimes I, I, I assume my viewers can just stick to something, but I, I think it just, um, so I take responsibility for this. Sometimes like different, different people I interview, I need to focus it more. So. Have yeah, you had this happen before? Um, no, this is, this is the first time. I mean, um, back in, back in 2000, maybe 17 i had another channel and i was interviewing this guy in taiwan and he wanted to just talk about taiwan so th- it's not martial arts related so that was too broad but that was the that was the other time it happened he's just like would jump topics i was like okay well i mean that's because we were just talking about taiwan but yeah i'll, I'll figure out another way to do this but um, i actually had a list of things if we went off on that topic that's why i was because we started talking more about the other stuff and the the martial arts part of it and that's where i was getting at is a lot of it why i'm why i feel i'm controversial is because i don't agree with a lot of the bullshit that's being put out today on how people are trying to uh, say oh gracie's is this or this style is the way and wait a minute no I train traditional martial arts, but I train traditional martial arts in the sense that it's, I, I'm training to hurt you. I'm not training to compete against you. I'm not training to get in a ring and to fight you to go, okay, I won. I'm fighting you to hurt you. I'm fighting you to stop you. And that's why these things were developed. You know, when we look at 
the the techniques and again um sports fighting is sports fighting and you know boxing is its own discipline and you know uh, the mixed martial arts that we have today has evolved into what we have as you know a striking grappling style it, again it's it's a sport it is what it is it's not a it's not reality based training it's you know when we look at reality based training you know the so uh, tony blair is uh, one of the law enforcement trainers and i i really have a lot of respect for it. the way he puts it is he teaches us the spear system is what the system is if you've heard of him and it's basically he said it you know what i teach is not a full-on martial arts or the, the spear that of itself when he was developing it it's not to teach you this this martial arts. It's to teach you a bridge, because that's how you're going to get ambushed. You know, anybody that gets ambushed is going to have that you know one two second. Oh shit! What do I do? How do I deal with it? But if you can train your natural responses to um, to react correctly in the situation to buy you that time, then you have that bridge, and um, that that's what he considers is that spear technique to be a bridge to allow you to do whatever it is you do. So, uh, you know, does it work in the street? Uh, you know, if you've used that term in before, and I would say in the street, anything would work. A uh, trash can laid over the head is going to work, you know, applied correctly. But are you able to calm your mind and be able to act under that pressure and that goes to that gross motor skill versus uh, finite motor skill. You know, if you practice what Bruce Lee say, I don't fear the guy who knows a thousand kicks. I fear the guy who's practiced one kick a thousand times. That's very true. So if I've trained something over and over again, um, so for instance, drawing a gun, how many steps are there from this position, going back, unlo unlocking a hood, unsnapping something, drawing it out, pressing it, bringing it up to my aiming eye and pull the trigger. That's a lot of steps. But if you train that over and over again, I find that I can draw my, my weapon and have it up to my eye in less than a second. And so in a, in a pre, so how did you have to learn that? You had to learn that in steps, right? So that would be with any other martial arts. Uh, let's look at your katas, your forms or whatever. So I think that you have a lot of styles that, you know, if they teach a lot, 10,000 forms, you, you get lost. The meaning gets lost. You know, where are we? What are we doing? Kind of like what we're talking about with the interview. You know, where are we going? What, what's going on? Keeping it honed down. Like you look at Wing Chun, three forms, Baji, two forms. You know, these they keep it simple, stupid. You know, just let's keep it that way. So when you look at, you know, the street and will this stuff work in the street? I think if you understand what it is you're doing, it will work. Um, how you apply it in, in the principles in which you apply it under and how you were taught. So, you know, even a Taekwondo guy um, back in the day, the Taekwondo we have today to the Taekwondo guys I grew up with two totally different animals. They hit you and put a hole in your ass back in the day. You know, they kick you and they're going to kick you, kick you so fast, so hard, so quickly, you're not even going to see it coming. But today you have this like paper dragon, as we would call it, or a dog without teeth. You know, they hit you and it's like, okay, I'm going to just grab you and bum rush you and slam you on the ground and beat the shit out of you because I've taken you out of your element because you can't kick me now. So, you know, that's just, you know, being a smart fighter. You know, that's a, a dude on the street knows that. Well, shit, he's hit me with my feet. Well, let me take him to the ground. He ain't going to be able to kick me now. So in that sense, that's what we have. And that's uh, with the the loss in, in martial arts today and what's not being taught and what needs to be taught. And I think that there's a few, there's a few teachers out there like Adam, um, Adam Chang, you know, who, who gets it, you know, I, and there's another uh, guy out there that gets it. It's a Wing Chun guy. And he's kind of out of England. Um, Dr. Mark Phillips, I think his name is yeah. the fighting science saying or whatever it is. Yeah, fight is. science. He's been on yeah. fight commentary chats too, but he's, yeah. Yeah, definitely gets it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's um, it's interesting because um, 
One of the other things, and I love you talk about Tony Blauer, and you know, one of the reasons I want to bring you on, you're, you're a law enforcement person and you're ex-Marine and stuff, but a lot of these martial arts instructors, even these like jujitsu black belts, a lot of them never got into a fight, like a real fight, right? My nose isn't this big because it's genetics. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I've had it broke three times and they wow. were in fights. So, mm-hmm. um, oh, can you still hear me? Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know if my things are going, they just kind of bubbled at me. Uh-oh. Um, <laughs> Uh, but that's the thing, you know, you know, getting punched in the face is a, is a real wake up call, you know, and having your nose broke. And uh, can you can you react to when it happens? And for me, I have found out I can. So um, like um, I, I'm an FTO, so I teach uh, rookies. And, uh, you know, so you're you, when you're going to arrest and they see you because they're talking to you, they're in the car with you. And they see you in this one frame. And you get on on the you're getting out there and you're dealing with somebody and all of a sudden you you flip this switch and you got this ah you know I call it full marine you know the full marine comes out ah and you're just and the, and the FTO is kind of like oh shit what the hell is this and you get back in the car and you're like da 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 and you're debriefing about it and you have to explain do you realize my blood pressure didn't even go up a point not even and that's the when you're looking at when you're fighting somebody. Your blood pressure is going to go up because you're somewhat excited. But in the sense, have you been enough to where you can allow that to stay here versus coming here and clouding this? And that's the real a battle. And that's the battle with anybody learning to fight. So when you get you don't have these particular schools that don't pressure test their shit um, in traditional forms. I'm talking, you know, we take long fist. Here, fight them but you got to use what you've been taught. You can't go to boxing. You can't go to grappling. You got to learn how to, when that attack comes and you're blocking that, and you're doing that hammer fist, how to make that damn thing work. Oh, can you hit? Is it only, can I hit right here? Or can I use that to hit the person's arm? Can I use it to hit them in the, in the kidney? Can I use them? Can I, you know, use this to do that? So uh, again, it goes back to when you're looking at sports fighting too, you know, a hammer fist is it meant to hit somebody on the top of the head. Why am I going to hit you in the thing that's used to protect your brain? I'm going to use it to hit you in the side of the neck so I can hopefully break something or hit you in your brachial plexus and knock you out. So again, why were these, these techniques developed and how are they actually to be applied? Um, they do work. You just have to pressure test them. to And that's one of like uh, Denarda Muhammad, who I'd mentioned earlier. One of the things we would do is, you know, we, we, for lack of a better term, we called it Chinese boxing because it was like, you can't do boxing. You can't get in there and box. (laughs) You've got to use your skills, this particular form that I've taught you and fight with it. And we would fight it like, you know, you would start out at like maybe a quarter of a speed. Okay, speed it up because you're getting in that flow kind of like, okay, that's how this works. He kicks, you pull back, you go and you attack. Oh, he defends, you know, so you're getting to this more of a flow of seeing how this stuff works again when we're looking at when these things were developed and how they were developed too i'm fighting i know he's fighting me when you're on the street per se and you're standing at the atm and someone's coming up because you've not had that situational awareness about you and you're just like da 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 hold on a minute da 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 while you're punching in your number and all of a sudden oh shit you know that that's what happens so again you can have the Bruce Lee gets snuck and how does he deal with it after he got snuck is the, is the big question. And I think that's the big question with anybody in, in, in martial arts. What are you going to, how are you going to regroup, get back, you know, get back onto that, into that thing uh, and back into your groove or, okay, what can I do? That's why I like Tony, you know, the, Oh shit, you know, cause that's what we do. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I'm not dead. I'm back in the fight and these all happen in milliseconds you yeah. know, when you start thinking about it it's milliseconds it's not yeah. people think oh that's one two three seconds no it's milliseconds that you're because if you've trained your brain to think this way over and over again and you've 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 thought about these type of situations then you're better to deal with it um back to uh doug davis he used the term mental image of training i believe there's a different term for it today um in the law enforcement community and martial community i can't think what the term is but it's basically you're you're going over these scenarios over and over and over and over in your head and how you're going to deal with it how is it going to feel 
And they've actually, this research has found that those mental reps you do are just as good as the physical reps, just as good as the physical reps. And that's what they would teach you. I'm I'm actually, I'm a SWAT operator. So I've I've had that type of training and tactical training. So, you know, those, you know, how am I going to come in the door? I'm training in my mind. Am I going to come in? Am I going to come in like this? You know, what if they grab my gun? How am I going to sit down and, you know, maybe, you know, get that that level. So you've trained this over and over and in your head. And then when you go and it happens because you've had those mental reps, all of a sudden you do it. It may not be pretty, but as one of my teachers says, Kung Fu is not meant to be pretty. It's meant to be effective. And so when you, when you look at that, that's, I think a, the, the meaning of all this, the meaning of why we train martial arts is you have to have a good teacher to, to want to express those things as well. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, and um, I think Shifu you know, Scott mentioned something really important, which is the, the going over in your mind thing, right? That is so important. Like I had a friend, um, I actually got him into jujitsu. So he's like training jujitsu now. But before when he wasn't training anything, he'd always be like, Jay, why are you always in your head going over situations as to what you would do? Like if you were attacked, so that's paranoid. I'm like, no, the whole point is I'm going over right now. So if it happens, because I have been attacked on the streets before, but I got out of it because like, thank goodness I had some Kung Fu training, you know, like I didn't get out of it in the most safest way, but I did. Right. And so, but you're here. Yeah, I'm here. So after (laughs) it happened in my mind, I'm like, this is why I have to prepare. So next time I'm even better. Right. So like, um, I'll tell you a very quick story. Uh, first time some guy tried to rob me on the street. I had about two seconds before I reacted. He could have robbed me and knock me out but thank goodness he was testing me first if he if he right. realized not to test me he could have just gone for me i would have been robbed right second time it happened years later I, I trained more so this time i saw a punch come my way and i reacted i was t- I, I but but like the thing is i didn't react before the punch i reacted when i saw the punch so again right. i didn't get the pre-attack cues right but at least it was better than before it took me two seconds and then uh like recently something happened where i saw a guy coming at me and i ran so see, yeah. it gets better. You go over these <laughs> in your head and you get it. First time I was already in the situation before I reacted. Second time, situation just happened and I reacted. Third time, I saw the situation coming. I ran, right? Like, Gotta see? go. <laughs> yes, yes, you could call maybe I go over those situations a lot. I train too much, but may- that's what prevented the third time. The guy was charging at me. I ran instead of he by the time he's in my face, I react. No. Not like you know? I'm gonna fight you now. Yeah. Bye. And <laughs> see you. like I'm, I love one of my coaches, but I talked to him about that third situation. You know what he told me? No, next time don't run. Next time just like sidestep him. If he needs to fight, fight him. I'm like, I'm not doing that. This dude oh, that was... freaking had a, sh- without a shirt, he was crazy. What if he had a screwdriver or something? And you know, that's why I want to bring someone like you, Scott, because um, I talked to another very awesome viewer about this. You know, he trains combatives, right? So he's a lot like you, like, you know, okay. with guns, yes. with knives, et cetera. But um, my, one of my coaches doesn't do that. You know, he's like a jujitsu, taekwondo, Muay Thai guy. You know, he's, he's tall, very, very skilled guy, but he doesn't, he doesn't train for situations where, you know, some guy might have a knife or some guy might have this or that, you know, it just, and these are conversations we have to talk about. Right. So you mentioned paranoid, my wife would, uh, so, you know, being a cop, being that, you know, situational awareness kind of guy, just how I'm hardwired, you know, I sit with my back to the door when we go to a restaurant, you know, like she'll go to sit down and I'm like, no, you sit over there. I'm the one with a gun. You know what I mean? And she would be like, you're paranoid. I'm like, and she would say that over and over again. So I said, no, I'm not paranoid. So I looked up the definition because I, I knew kind of, I kind of had an idea, but it, my wife's pretty intelligent. So you can't just come at it with her bullshit. You got to like <laughs> facts. So uh, I, I'm like, well, first of all, I'm not paranoid because paranoid, one of the key components for paranoid is fear. For the word paranoid, must have fear you have to have a fear component or you're not paranoid it's something else she's like you know like fuck you (laughs) so uh and and so i would i know how i explained to her one day i said so you got people living in israel right they walk out their door and they're doing that 360 all the time are they paranoid are they being cautious they're being cautious because they're going to look for that bag on the ground that dude walking in the crowd with a big heavy jacket that shouldn't be here. Do I need to get out of this, out of this area because he could possibly be some type of 
you know, guy going to set off some kind of uh, suicide bomb. Yeah. So again, are these, is this paranoid or is this thinking in a way of being situational awareness? This is where we get back to, you know, when the martial arts were developed in a feudal time, this is the way they thought. Yeah. We live in a safe society, pretty much every being in China. I never felt endangered. And I was in some pretty royal places, but I never felt endangered, you know? So, and then um, it also goes back to humanity and humans. Um, I had a chief, he sat me down one day, one of my chiefs that I worked for, and he gave me this, this kind of topic about how humans are. He goes, uh, so you deal with a hundred percent of the people you deal with 90% of those people that are people that made a bad decision that day. They sped, they stole something, they got in a fight, whatever it is. So 90% of those people just made a bad decision, but they're not bad people. They're, they're protect, they're, they're good people and would do good. They just made a bad decision that day. He goes, so you have this other 10% that they're your habitual criminals. They're the ones you're constantly resting all the time, always get in trouble. They got some moral compass break. He goes, they're not bad, but they're not good. Mm -hmm. But he goes, out of that 10%, you got 1% and they're your wolves. They're a hundred percent evil people. So remember when you deal with people, 90% of them are just people that made a bad decision and they're good people. So that had a big impact on me early in my career in law enforcement. And so when you look at going in the way we live today, and I would even say, I would say back in the feudal times, because you can't, you can't go around causing havoc, you know, hate and discontent, robbing people before the local village goes, we've had enough of you. And they get their hose and their rakes and whatever they're going to go and they're going to find your ass. And there's one of you and a whole bunch of them. So you're going to be outnumbered. Eventually you're going to get got. So when we start looking at that, that, that idea here, especially in America, we live in a pretty safe society, you know, for the most part, I would say that you're pretty safe walking around, walking around New York without being gotten. But Again, do you want to be a, a sheep just walking around or do you want to take that next step because it can happen and at one time when you need it, you don't have it. It's like, you know, one is none, two is one and three is enough. You know, it's kind of that concept. I want to have that in my toolbox to be able to deal with it. Um, I was listening to a, um, I don't know if it was a podcast or an audio book or something. It was about how to read body language and look for those pre cues and stuff like that and it was taught by a dude who was who was a cia operative or whatever and he was like i'm walking in new york he says always carry a um the pin the the tactical pin he's like always carry a steel or a tactical pin he goes because it's the only thing you can carry that anybody it's not a weapon it's a pin and it's like oh it makes good sense and so he was walking in new york or something like that and he could tell by the pre cues of this dude walking towards him that this guy was going to try to take his girlfriend or his wife's purse or something like that. So he shift positions, got the pin out of his things, but he knew how to do the, cause he had studied how the mind works with people and how to, you know, they see this, then they do this. And he was able to put himself in that position to where the guy rethought, like you were talking about your situation where he was testing you before he attacked you to, you know, eh, maybe not this guy, but he had had that tactical pin in his hand case it went south so he could jab them and again we need to that goes back to are you learning a martial arts traditionally or a hybrid system that's actually teaching you what this stuff really means and how it works um that goes into punching and fajing um which i'm sure you're familiar with you know when you punch somebody how what and that's another thing i think too is lost in um the way we translate things language so when you're looking at a you know, I say Fa Jing and, and Americans are going, what the hell is Fa Jing? You know, what, what, what's that? So, you know, it's kinetic energy. Oh, okay. Yeah. When you hit a bat or swing a golf ball, you know, or swing a, a golf club. So learning that kind of, and, and a teacher actually teaching you how to apply that stuff and, and making it work, you know? So I think it's a very important thing. Yeah, exactly. Um, so many things just, just to even pick from that part we talked about, but um, you know, the, the whole body language and then, yeah, I think, I think anyone watching this conversation would, they should really learn from this as like, there's an emphasis, of course, on, okay, stress test, a spar, but think beyond that, right? I mm -hmm. think that's what Shifu Scott Grady's teaching us. Think beyond that. Think 
beyond, okay, is this going to work if I step into the cage or if I spar a dude one-on-one? Because one of the things that occurred to me as we were talking about this, you know what would make jujitsu schools like attract another subset of people is if they say, okay, you're on the ground now. What do you do if someone else comes? Jujitsu mm. schools should train that. Okay, you're on the ground now. How do you get up when someone else, you see someone else from the corner of your eye come, oh, they never train that. Wouldn't so, that make jujitsu way more effective? Well, so you look at we look at jujitsu jujitsu today in America is not jujitsu in Japan. It's a totally different thing. So when you when when you know who are we talk about, so you look at what we see today is more that uh, that um, system of the Gracies and the way they brought it. It's all on the ground. Well, traditional jujitsu is not all on the ground. A lot of it's up. On, it's up, and if I have to go to the ground. Or if I take you to the ground, what do I do at that point in time? There's a lot of joint locks or, or chinas and stuff like that that are going to occur prior to that. Once I get my hands on your ass, you know, what am I going to do? How am I going to apply this joint lock? So when you look at how it, it evolved, because I, I bet you, because uh, again, history is his story, right? So you have the Gracies telling you this, his story about how, these two guys came over there from Japan and they were taught them, but were they really teaching them the, the actual um, traditional jujitsu? And then they said, Hey, well, let's evolve it into this. And then it evolves into what we have today. So, you know, it, it's to teach that. So if you take these guys in Japan, they do teach, they do train for that second person, that third person, because they train a kick. So I've got you over here. And all of a sudden, I see out of the corner of my eye someone coming, and I do that sidekick, you know, to get you off of me to buy me that time. They train that, but when you're totally on the ground, um, and look at the evolution of of, of uh, the sports, not using that word UFC, but that the that type of fighting, all it was, you know, the ground was dominating the the sport itself because these people that were coming in, uh, I'll fight you put them in a box they've never trained in grappling all of a sudden get took to the ground and they're not used to wrestling around with person and i can't poke you in the eye to get you off me i can't rip your ear off and get you off me so i got to deal with what i'm doing but now you have these people that they started learning it but they were strikers to begin with that started in a, a, a traditional style of martial arts now they're fighting these guys and all of a sudden they're getting back up and knocking them the hell out you see the weirdest kicks I, I'm going to run up, jump off the side of, and, you know, and punch you and knock you out. You know, wait a minute. What happened to the ground dominating the system? What happened about, you know, this being the be all to end all martial arts and we have it all. It, 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 it's, it's a fallacy. It's, it's, it's not true. And um, um, I think um, this is actually a good place to ask Shifu Scott this question because you're a cop, right? Um, I've heard many cops who've, actually analyze that quote unquote data gets thrown around about how 80 or 90 percent of fights go into the ground and apparently that statistic isn't true and as yeah, a cop right. you would be the expert to talk about that i would like uh, going back to when i talked about earlier um i've never i've never wrestled with anybody on the ground i've taken them to the ground to put them in that that prone position to handcuff them but i've never had to wrestle with anybody because i never let it get there because I don't want to be there because I don't know if he's got a buddy. Um, I don't want to be having all this gear. Another thing too, this gear also gets all up and tied up and restricts you. You, you have an advantage over me that I don't want you to have. So again, I never put myself in a position or try to humanly never put myself in that position that allows me to be at a disadvantage, whether it be distance angling, uh, how I'm encountering the person. And um, so like one of the things I teach my rookies is, Everybody is unsafe until you deem them to be safe. You understand what that means? So in other words, I don't care if it's grandma. They are unsafe until you deem them to be safe. And that would be the same for me. So my statement would be they're unsafe until I deem them to be safe, even if you've already deemed them to be safe. They're still unsafe until I deem them to be safe. So with this mindset, and if you always approach every situation with that mindset, then you're going to have x y you know a b c d whatever and then if you get a b q oh wait a minute something's not right it allows you to now what do i do so i think that's a a thing that 
it's not even, I don't see it being taught a lot, even into the, uh, our community as law enforcement officers, you might hear like a mention of something like that, but never directly like that. So like, for instance, um, in searching somebody, I search you, right? Um, you're arrested. I hand you off to the next guy. Well, we teach that, well, the next guy searches you too, because I could miss something. So if we have that mindset already, then why aren't we applying this? I do a traffic stop. We have a tinted out car. Okay. It's say it's a Cadillac. It's, it's an, a very expensive car that typically someone who's not going to hurt you is going to be in that car, right? They have tinted out windows where you can't see in the back seat. So they roll down their, their driver's side window and I approach the car. I don't go past that door with a tinted window without saying, roll down that back window. Huh? What? Roll down the back window. Roll down the back window. Roll down the back window. Until they roll down the back window. Oh, the back window doesn't roll. Can I open up the door so I can see inside? Well, no. Well, then I'm not moving past that point. Because you remember, we have a Q. A, B, Q. Because every normal person would be like, oh, yeah, sure. Because I will let you look in the back seat. Kind of they get why you're looking back there to make sure there's nobody back there. You know, but somebody who's trying to deceive you will not let you look back there. So can you hear me? Did my uh, volume Oh, I can down? hear you very well. I can hear you. Very okay. well. This is so interesting. I'm just, I turn my mic off sometimes because sometimes the trash truck comes over. Okay. Like our city government, I'm just going to tell you, our city government, um, our tax money pays for the trash truck coming like four times a day, but then there's homeless people everywhere in the park. That's beautiful city management right there. <laughs> <laughs> But so I don't pass, I don't pass that point because I, I have not deemed it safe. So it's unsafe until I deem it safe. And it would be the same for anybody else on that scene or any other officer. So with that mindset, that's the, that's what I try to instill in my rookies. And it's not a paranoid. It's not a, Oh, I'm in fear. No. If you have a system of doing something, you maintain that system with everybody you encounter you know when to de-escalate it. You should know when, to de- if you don't, then you have, we have some other training we need to work on and that's your personality. Um, so you need to be able to de-escalate that. Oh, that's grandma. How are you doing, grandma? How's it going? Uh, you know, and you move into that, that other frame of that other personality that you have to wear as a cop, you know? And um, so we need to train that more. So I think in law enforcement is that type of tactic is you need to be always, and they do, but it's not, I don't, it gets lost. I see it getting lost. Yeah. And I will add to what you say is that I find it lost in general in, in most people, even people who train martial arts. And again, it goes back to what you're saying, Shifu, about how our society's safe, right? Our society tends to be even like you look at the place with that always generates mm-hmm. controversy, China. China's a very safe place. Most of the places in China city-wise are very safe. So of course people don't need to like learn deadly martial arts there because there's no (laughs) reason to, right? But even in America, like in a lot of places, as much as we got gun violence, we got certain things, it's a lot safer than a lot of other places in the world, right? And so I think what this does is, um, it does create this kind of complacentless, even complacent, Mm. (laughs) sometimes those words are hard to say even in people who like teach martial arts like i've had many incidents where um one time i was with one of my coaches and um there's this guy again it was in that park over there this guy's coming up like this close behind us and i was the only one that reacted i literally turned i'm like and the guy like the guy like looked at me he's like yo you think i'm gonna steal you or something i'm like i don't know but you shouldn't be getting that Are close you? behind me. My <laughs> coach didn't do that. My coach was just like sitting there like, he's like, if he's going to do something, I'm going to do something back. But he like, you got to at least like react a little, like make it known to him. Like, I'm not trying to be aggressive with you, but you don't get That's that close behind me. That's knows not to attack you. Yeah. Yeah, if exactly. You think about it. Yeah. It, you know, so that it's, you know, if you think about a predator, they stalk you. Yeah. Right. In some way, shape or form. And if there's, and this is even in, in the, in, in our humans, we, they stalk. Yeah. They test it. So I live real close to New Orleans. So real close. And um, we we go over there all the time. And I was actually over there with one of my students one day and I was waiting for my wife. She was in some doing something. I don't know. And so uh, I, I took him over there with me. And of course, I don't go to New Orleans without a gun because, again, you know, I'm always going to be up in the fight. It's just how I think, you know, and I'm illegally I'm legally allowed to carry it. So I'm standing there and I'm watching this guy 
towards us. And Anthony, my student, was just standing there. And he's walking towards us and walking, and I could just tell. He's beelining for us. He was some homeless dude. And he was going to, I don't, he was going to panhandle, but then I could tell by behavior, he was going to try to pressure that man, that panhandle. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, like try to, cause we're, our backs are against the wall. So he's going to try to block our avenues of it. I could tell by his, those cues, you know, that we talked about his body language. And so he got probably about 10 feet away. I got up off the wall and I said, you better keep stepping or this is going to be a bad day for you. And he was like, what? Cause I, Broke his OODA loop. I broke it. I totally, his train, he, I broke it. And that's about what you were talking about. Looking at the guy, he was, he was a predator. He was, he was, he was in his way stalking us. And because I let him know that, Hey, you're not just going to walk up here. You got to recalculate and rethink because he had already formulated a plan. And then like Mike Tyson says, a, a good plan, uh, you have a good plan until you get punched in the face, you know, that kind of thing. So, and that was the the punch in the face is, you know, it's going to be a bad day. And so me being armed had nothing, nothing to do with what I did, but he had to recalculate what, who, uh, how do he, how do he even know, you know, so who is this guy? And so he, he said some explicitives and he kind of veered off and went in another direction because he knew. But yeah. and, and that's part of that reading those body cues. And so exactly. You've got to challenge the predator. If you don't challenge the predator, he's going to he's going to get you. Yeah. And um, like viewers watching, um, this is stuff to learn from Shifu Scott. Like this is valuable stuff. Like in general, our society, sometimes I think we have this kind of like almost fear of like, oh, my God, I'm going to be annoying or I'm being insensitive. But if this person is giving you a bad vibe, you know, don't go like, I'm going to kick your, don't, don't go like that, but just be like, Hey, what's up? Like, you know, yeah. I've had multiple their, incidents. Yeah. Break. The, I love that word. Use break their OODA loop. Someone else, my other friend who does Aikido uses that word to OODA loop. So it, I love that word. I'd have to look up with it. it basically it's um, you uh, observe, orientate, um, decide action. I think that's what it is. D decide action. Mm -hmm. So the fighter pilot Boyd, I think his name was came up with that training cycle of what they were doing when their dog fights and things and if you could the break that person's zoodle loop that's dog fighting you then you can gain the advantage because they're constantly having to go back into that cycle you understand what i mean because yeah. you're changing it you're changing it so um there's a in shooting for instance um so most people are right-handed so we're right-handed shooting so they found that um if I'm shooting someone and I'm tracking a target, if I, if you move to my left, I can inquire and hit you much quicker with a round than if you move to my left, because I have to cross myself. My right has to cross itself. So there's a saying, always move right to your right. So if you're coming at me, if you're a right-handed person, so I'm using the law of average, the odds per se, if you are coming at me and I step right, it's harder for you to re-engage. So when you're looking at breaking up that oodle loop, so coming at me and I just step to my right, just a little bit, just a mouth, you have to re-engage because you're a right hand, you're having to cross. But if I move to your left, you it's easier for you to re I can so even if you look at a, a traditional boxer, right? I'm a right hand, even though I'm right-handed, my left hand's forward, right? You step, you step to my left, I've already got this much blocking it. If you think about the angle, so if you're coming at this angle, if you step into this quadrant, I can stop that angle, I can stop that much quicker than if I'm here and you step this way, I've got to change. I've got to, change that whole angle to stop that quadrant. So always move right. You have the law of averages on your side. Step to your right. It's harder for them to re-engage. You've, you've disrupted their, their thought process to where they now have to re-engage and it's much uh, more dynamic style of how they're gonna have to re-engage because they have to change positions if they're traditionally taught to fight with, with the left hand forward, so. Yeah, um, that, that's such a great topic about OODA loops because part of, just like talking to someone, right? Let's say someone's in this mode. Okay, I, I'm gonna do something. Talking to 
mm, mm, oh, mm, yeah. oh, right, right. They're focused. Yeah. <laughs> so like, like I I know it's like some people think okay if this guy's about to attack me or something I talk to him it's gonna make him attack me more. No, if this guy's like, and you're like, hey, what's up? Hmm? Yeah, exactly. So that's part of like say someone you you've already picked up on their cues, right? Like you don't have to be aggressive in your, like you're saying, approach of like, Hey, but I knew at that point in time with that particular guy, I needed to do that because if I'd have been like, use some type of passive way, he would have not responded to that. Mm. He would have, he, he would, he would, that would feed him because he's used to that passive type reaction from people. He's not used to somebody being like, this will be a bad day. Yeah. Oh yeah. shit. What do you, oh, okay. I've got, this is not normal. I'm not going to just be able to get money. Yeah. So, so for instance, that person, you picked up on them cues, right. And you see it and you approach them first. Hey man, what time is it? Hey, can you tell me where? Cause now they're like, uh, 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 <laughs> cause they were focused on you. They're going to X, Y, Z do whatever. And then all of a sudden you're now, what time is it? And they're like, and that gives you, one or two seconds or milliseconds to if he goes for something or whatever, he's thinking, you know, he's having to calculate differently. You broke that cycle. Yeah. And yeah. He's observed you. He's, he's orientated himself to you. He's made his decision. He's going to do whatever. And then he's planned that action and you get him right before that action stage. He's got to go back to, Oh, observe and then reorientate. And that's part of breaking the, the cycle of the oodle loop and what they mean by that. And that's so, so interesting, um, um, following up on Shifu Scott saying about how, you know, uh, besides someone so like a predator's OODA loop, you also have to be aware. This all part of situational awareness. This is why it, it makes sense to think about this often. It's being cautious. I love the word being cautious, okay? But think about how someone who's a <clears> predator <throat> might try to break your OODA loop, right? Um, mm-hmm. Let's say a guy, the, the first time I had an incident, this was 2017. This is actually what got me back into training. The guy was breaking my OODA loop. He asked me, hey, you got to smoke? Hey, you got to smoke? You yeah, know? he used it against you. Yeah. <laughs> so suddenly you. I'm thinking about, no, I don't have a smoke. And I, I was walking, right? And suddenly, because, you know, my I'm, I'm walking. He asked me if I have a smoke. So it breaks my OODA loop. So now I'm thinking about smoke. I'm not focusing on the environment. And then he actually, he actually tested me because... He touched me. He's like, yo, you got to smoke. You like kind of went like this. Yeah. 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 So yeah. you like, they're breaking your OODA loop. But it's like back then I didn't uh, pick it up that something was wrong until he cut me off a second time. Then I was like, oh, oh you want to go? But see, the first time he tested me, if he were a really like a career criminal, he would have realized, okay, my OODA is broken. Punch him in the face. But he tested me a second time, got me out of it. But like he wasn't he, sure. Yeah, he wasn't <laughs> sure. But if the first time he just went for it, I would have been robbed. Right. But yeah. like, like so these are all things to think about. But like, people, whether because they don't want to be um, perceived as paranoid or whatever, they'll think about this. But like, you got to in society just because your neighborhood is safe. Like at that time, I wasn't living in a safe neighborhood, so I should be thinking about that. But like, right. even if your neighborhood is safe, you should still be thinking about this because you never know, man. I mean, if anything last year taught us anything, even the safest neighborhoods got like burned, you know, like burned to the ground. Yeah. Well, that's also, if you look at home invasions, a lot of home, some home, or I, I'd have to look at the FBI's reports of, you know, where these were actually happening. But if you look at some of the videos of these home evasions of people that have cameras, they're not typically bad neighborhoods. You know, it's me going to kick in the door and, and for whatever reason um to to do a home invasion so thinking like that is thing you need to we still need to think that way because if that skill is lost what happens when the real predators come out you know and i think that that's a real important thing so um my my first teacher he taught what was called the abc d's of self-defense that's what he would call it and it was a be aware always be aware and that's the a b when you just when you notice that something is not right, there's a cue in the middle of your is you need to back off. You there? Yeah, it looks like a switch to the phone, which is fine. Uh, yeah. so, uh, you back off. Um, you back you back off. You get that distance. Uh, so there's a term that we use in in shooting and in law enforcement is distance to gates accuracy. So the more so the further away I am. Uh, it, you know, it, you're less likely to hit me with a round or even in, in a, a physical confrontation. 
if you go to punch and I just step back, like if someone jabs at me and I think back that you perceive the, the hit the strike right here, but I've moved it an inch here. So it takes a lot of that kinetic energy away. And then the C is to capitalize on that first and what he would call last mistake. So the first and last mistake. So the guy that touched your arm, as soon as he touched your arm, if you'd have, Hey, who are you? You know, it's just something simple or just, you know, something like taking his arm and then putting it right in the middle of him. You understand what I mean? Cause you've created that bridge that he's now got to cross just that simple. You didn't destroyed his Uber loop. He'd have been like, Oh shit. You know what just happened? And you did it so subtly. So you capitalize on that mistake and then D you destroy and you destroy everything. Their will to fight their, their, you destroy them physically, mentally, all of it. And, and that's, but you take it through that cycle. But you have to go through that. You have to get to the destroy place because that's ultimately what I'm, I'm trained to do. I'm not, this is not a friendly bout. You know, that's not what I train for. Um, I train for, to protect myself, my family. And again, uh, Adam Chan going to, you know, I take the tree, I'm making a, you know, making a chair or making a table is a good way to put it. You know, that's why I train this. And um, uh, that was probably one of the first, introductions to um looking at how to break uh things down in your in your perspective but always be aware always that was like my lesson number one <laughs> always be around what's around you yeah this is um some awesome food for thought man i if viewers could take something out of a b c d i love it man awareness um um b is the back off c is capitalized D is destroy. And again, the D doesn't have to be physically destroyed. It could be just mentally destroy them. Oh, okay. They don't want to do whatever they were going to do. Right? What? Yeah. It's, um, it's interesting. Um, I'll give another kind of interesting, this is actually a very cool law, law enforcement example too. So because of what's going on right now, you know, some people are extra scared, right? So one time, this was so funny. I was walking to the beach. There was this couple a little older, uh, and I guess they thought I was walking too close to them. I mean, they could have just been like, oh, dude, do you mind? But instead, the <laughs> guy pointed a finger, almost hit me in the face. Hey, stay six feet back. <laughs> like, so like I had to break his OODA loop, man. First of all, he, he did a lot of things wrong in that situation, but I had to break his OODA loop. It was an older white guy. I'm like, dude, are you being racist? I just like, I was just messing with him. Like, are you being racist? You know, he, he's an older, older, like white guy with his wife looked a little younger. So he's probably trying to impress his wife, but I'm like, he did so many things wrong. Like that's another example of what not to do, right? For, if you really felt threatened by me, that's not to like challenge me. Like, I was without a shirt too. Maybe he thought I was homeless. I don't know. Like, so, but like, you know, stick a finger. This is assault right there. Stick a finger right here. If you hit me, that's actually assault. Right. But like, I, I was justified. I kind of hit him back, but like that, that, like, that's another form of education because people living in safe societies, they don't understand that there's certain things you can't do too. I've had so many incidents right. here. People will like mouth off at me and it's like a dark street. And in my mind, I'm like, wow, if you grew up in another area, you would have never said something like that. It's at night. You're a woman. You're mouthing off to me. It's a dark street. Like, are you serious? But like, these are things that like get lost in society as people get quote unquote safer, more complacent, whatever. The, the uh, people being, they, they, they like the sheep, the, that, that we would sheep pull. And that's what you have is the, uh, so they refer to the law enforcement as the sheepdog, right? So um, General Grossman wrote the, that little essay kind of on the sheepdog. And in that, just to surmise it, is that, you know, the sheep don't like the sheepdog and they'll eventually start to ridicule the sheepdog because it reminds them of the wolf. Because we have fangs, we look like them, we bark and things like that. And we bark at them to get them to keep them in safe places, but we're doing it for their safety. But then when the wolf comes, they're like, sheepdog, protect me, protect me. But then they, they easily forget, you know, that, you know, the, the, the sheepdog then starts reminding them of the wolf again. So we will always go through these cycles. And I, I would say that would be the same if you looked at medieval Europe, you had the, the sheriffs of the time where the, the term sheriff comes from. And, you know, they were basically the, the law enforcement for that particular area of land that was appointed by the king to collect taxes or whatever, whether they were good or bad indifference. But 
why did the people hate them? Because they reminded them of the people that were coming to also steal and, you know, because they had swords and things like that. So, but when shit hit the fan, where's the sheriff? Where, you know, help us, help us. So people, they, again, that's one of the things about living in a safe society that, that one of the downfalls. And like you even said in China, at no time I ever felt unsafe ever. And we were in some pretty rural areas. And uh, I actually went to, um, it's called, um, shoot, now I can't remember. It's between uh, Chengdu and Chongqing. It's on the Yellow River. And it's actually where uh, Song Li was from. That's her hometown. And they, like we met some, I met a Chinese cop over there. This before I was ever a cop, you know, I was out of the military working. I was actually working on military bases. I called it glorified personal trainer at the time. I was working at one of the base gyms. And uh, so uh, he was like, oh, come on. He was like, come over here. And he was showing us stuff. He did some kind of weird style. I don't even know what it was, but he would do like, like he had like a baji arm he would use and stuff like that. And it was just kind of, you know, but he was like, cool. It was never like he was trying to figure out who I was or, you know, are you a spy or any of that? None of that. It was just like chill, chill. And it's a, it's a, I had a very similar situation. So, um, I grew up in Chengdu also, oh, um, wow. and, um, we, my parents were professors at one of the colleges. So, um, of course there's like security in the colleges, right? But the security was just like, just some student probably doing a work study job. And like, I remember he was so chill. And then, uh, my dad's even like, can I see this weapon you're holding? He had some kind of baton and he like, let someone check out his weapon it's like that's that's like a safe society right there like you know in america imagine hey can i check out your weapon you would never do that as a cop right hey, but like, your gun. yeah Not exactly you yeah like i remember my dad even made fun of the guy's baton he's like yeah this can't hurt anyone and the, the student who was the security guy's like yeah it's just like for show <laughs> but like <laughs> you know <laughs> that, that's another thing too uh when you look at uh soldiers the i can't remember the general you know dress them like soldiers they'll be soldiers but that they look so if we look at the uniform of cops today, it's the most unpractical uniform ever designed, ever made for what we do. It is. It's made of polyester, burns quickly, see, would it, you know, just eat the flesh off of you quickly in a fire. They put fire retardant stuff in it nowadays, but whatever. It's uncomfortable um, for when we have to actually do something, but it's the look. When you see that cop step on scene, and he's like this and it's trim and it's and he, it's like oh shit it just got real <laughs> so it's that perception too because if you actually probably knew the cop probably couldn't flay his way out of a wet paper bag you know so it's it, it is what it is but part of that is also so if you look at a lot of the matt dojos you know they've got on this elaborate freaking gi with all kinds of crap all over it and you're looking at him going you couldn't fight your way out of a wet paper bag, guarantee it, with a machete. <laughs> yeah, um, Shifu Scott, I think this is the perfect segue to talking about, you know, you as a Shifu, as a teacher. So, um, you're a cop. Do you train people kind of on the weekends? Um, I know you talked about you train kind of the rookies in, um, you know, the police academy. But, like, academy. what about, like, oh, okay. Okay. So, yeah, tell me more about kind of how you train people, you know, your school, et cetera. So um, so far as in law enforcement training, it, uh, the training that I do is with, police, you know, individual police officers and things like that, because in our profession, you have to have a like general certification for teaching. And then you have to teach so many classes before they allow you to do it in broad, you know, like for academies and things like that. Um, but I've learned a lot on my own that a lot of the officers have come up to me because they work with me and they're like, look hey show help me teach me things like that so that's happened throughout my years where i've actually taken them off the side and i usually go back to the tony blair like look i can i can spend 20 years teaching you and you might get it but we're trying to condense you know as much information as we can in a short amount of time so let's take what i know you can learn that you naturally have that's ingrained in your body it's ingrained into you and let me show you what that is and then teach you to use that for you. And that's the push away danger and the basic, the spear technique and outside knowledge. Real simple stuff. Um, so far as in when we get into the training traditional martial arts, um, that's one of been one of my struggles because of my moving around a lot. I had started a, a small school 
uh, a, a group of people when I was in North Carolina. And then my wife's like, hey, I'm moving home, which is down here on the Gulf Coast. Hope you come with me. Well, I don't want to be divorced, so I guess I'm coming with you. So I had to close that down. And uh, then you're teaching again. And I do Tai Chi. So I've, and I'm, I'm actually 50. I may not work it, but I'm, I'm 50. Yeah, I thought uh, you were like 42. So uh, I'm, I'm 50. So I, I do Tai Chi and I like Tai Chi. I like it more because it, it when you look at muscle, muscular development, structure and things like that it, it can it, again what piece is this in my in my actual puzzle where does it fit and it, it gravitates to a lot of people looking for help and things like that but they wind up getting with me and i wind up teaching well you're seeing this you know part of course is it's not what you think it is so then i'll actually teach them the martial application and they're like oh my god i didn't realize it was this small like yeah it's this is actually was a martial arts before it was ever health you know, so teaching them that. And so I teach some people that. And then I took a couple uh, private students more so like, you want to learn martial? Like I have one, Anthony, who was my martial arts student. Uh, he's my like PD. I actually took him as a, a disciple and teach him very like, he's like my only student that I teach to right now. Like don't teach anybody else. And like, we'll call him whatever. Cause when I was moving around, it'd be you know, like, Hey, get on the phone, show me, send me, send me your form, show me this, you know, do whatever. So as much as you can. And um, so he was doing judo or keto, I'm sorry, keto at the time. And uh, he was like, teach me. He kept bugging me and bugging me and bugging me. Cause I had, uh, was made friends with his uh, teacher in Dallas. And uh, cause I needed a place to train like, a, like, Hey, I'm a martial artist. Would you mind if I worked out in your studio, like in between? And it's just me training and, you know, made friends with him. He's like, sure, here's a key. Go ahead. That's one good thing about the martial arts community is we're a small knit community. Um, a lot of us traditional martial artists. And we, uh, if you find the right people, a lot of them are about, let's, you know, let's learn, let's learn together. Let's take it to that next level. Let's, and so I've always been gravitating in finding those type of people. And Dallas was one of them. And so he let me train there, but Anthony wound up running into me a few times and wanting to train with me. And finally, I like, I had his number. I'm like, meet me at your dojo now. I pulled up in the car. I said, you want me to teach you? He goes, I said, I'll teach you. I said, the first thing you got to do is ask your teacher permission. So I ain't going to do it unless so I don't want no ill feelings, bad will, or any of that bullshit. And what you're going to learn is going to hurt. So he was like, so before you say yes, you better be aware that what I'm going to teach you is going to hurt. You're going to, you're going to learn through experience. He's like, okay. So he did it. He stuck with me and has been with me for, I think, 2000, 10, so since 2011. He's, he's pretty much been my student here in Mississippi. But moving around is really downplayed. I'm actually back. Uh, I've only been back in uh, southern Mississippi for a year. We left for like three years because uh, my wife's work and stuff moving around. So we went to Florida and then to Richmond, Virginia and then back here. So hope, I'm hoping once things get, because the COVID is this whole pandemic BS is really put a stopper on things. So I'm hope, I'm waiting for things to kind of calm down with that and then me to start reaching out and saying, okay, I'm teaching it. Because I have I actually owned a gym in Waveland, Mississippi, which is right down the street. And my secret evil plan with the gym was to put a space off of it. It started out as just the gym. And then I was able to expand to create the like exercise room, my dojo. Um, so, and that's where I met, I was teaching Tai Chi to people. And then we segued into in there. And so I was doing that for a few years. And then I'm like, got to sell the gym. Got to close the scope down. Wife makes too much money. Got to go. So that's kind of where, where we were at and what we did. We moved around and that's kind of put that back. So now I've got to rebuild a uh, school. And again, I don't know if I really want to, uh, I need a, I need to train with people. And that's more so for my own thing is to train with people. But so far as in, I don't know if I want to dive into some kind of big school type or uh, to teach like that. I would rather teach a few people who really wanted to learn versus having a school of teaching you know, a shit ton of people and get lost. 
get that, you know, we're, we're getting lost in the, in the mud. I also taught a guy, he, he apparently trained uh, Tai Chi. This was in uh, Richmond. I ran into him. Float zones. If the floating stuff that they do, the pods that Seth Ro- uh, Rogan does it, or, or not, whatever his name is, Joe Rogan does the, the, uh, the floating. And I ran into him just on a whim, come to find out he had learned Tai Chi back in the day. And we got teaching, so I started teaching him, and he had uh, MS. So it was really good for him to learn because it you know, murder skills for him. And uh, so and, uh, basically I do 24, 48 step, and then I do chin style as well. So I taught. Uh, he didn't learn. He learned the, the 108 frame form uh, from somebody. I can't. I, can, I, I know the teacher, but I can't think of the name of who this, who his this teacher was. And then uh, I taught him. So that's about the teaching students and whatnot. I see. Um, because um, when you contacted me on Facebook, I saw your school is called Tianxing, right? Tianxing Jian. So that is currently just just like an online brand. It's not like a physical location. Me and you, I'm so um, my teacher in Japan, Okinawa, uh, Miyahara Sensei. Um, his name of his school is Tianjin. I'm, I know I'm butchering the dialect, but Tianjin Jin. Um, Megua, or no, how do you say Chinese and Chinese? Chinese martial arts or Wushu Association is basically what it is. And I, you know, me, I'm always for the, I ask questions, the annoying student. That's what, I guess why he loves me. So, because I, because he's like that too. He had, and that, again, that relationship between him and uh, uh, Weyata Sensei, it's, you know, what does Tianjin mean? And apparently it comes from some famous saying like i've run into chinese people to try to get because again i don't speak japanese that well he doesn't speak english that well so you have this you know trying to figure it out and then get my ex-wife time to try to translate it into you know some way to get me to understand what it is into people and they oh attention and they all say the whole sentence and i'm like yeah that one and apparently it's like an upright person you know if they do right they're they're going to to have good fortune or whatever, something like that. I, again, the meaning of it to me is irrelevant. You chose a name of that, that's fine. I understand what you're, I understand what you're, what you're saying and what you're trying to teach and by having that name. So I get it. I understand the context of it. So that's kind of what that means. It's not, again, it's a, we, when we talked about the system, it's a system versus a style, you know, because he teaches, you know, Long fist, uh, trend, baji trend, fun, uh, uh, kao shu fanzu, and the pigwa. So it's a, you know, I'm teaching you this to, to teach you this small. I want out of all this, I want you to get this one small component, but I got to teach you all this so you can get this one small component of the form. So he would use the forms. So, uh, kind of digressing a little bit on the uh, Wen Jing Ming, te- making him go to these teachers was so he sent him to his uh, wife first. Too long for, uh, to learn the Sa Trin and Sufis stuff. And it was because you're not fast enough. You're, 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 you're slow. Oh, okay. You've gotten fast. Now you need to learn how to develop power. Learn Baji from my friend here. You're ready. Now it's time to learn. And so, uh, again, to, to, to teach that in that way is, again, I think important. And again, in martial arts, if you traditional use the word tradition traditional versus uh you know mixed martial arts what's traditional are we using the word traditional to be like exactly what i taught you 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 learn and you pass that same exact thing to the next person i don't think of it that way because again um we have and my teacher would explain it like this martial arts is like transportation so we didn't have cars we didn't have trucks so we learned to walk. Then we, de- we learned we could ride horses. Then we developed wagons. And then we developed the automobile. Then we developed boats. And then we developed, you know, airplanes. Well, that's your martial arts journey. You can't say, well, no, all we can do is walk because that's traditionally what we do. Well, these guys are driving around on cars. They're getting, they're getting four towns over, you know, in, in 10 minutes where we're having to walk, you know, 14 miles. So looking at our martial arts and, and mixed martial arts and why is it popular is because they're not sticking to one traditional frame of learning. They're allowing those things in that they're finding to be effective. Well, 
if you're now if they teach their next student that way of thinking, then you're they're traditional. They're maintaining that tradition, allowing it to be open. And I think in the martial arts, if we look at the evolution of any pretty pretty much any martial arts style, it probably started out with just techniques. Then those techniques became some type of form, and then those forms turned into other techniques, which developed other forms, and then you get this, you know, now you have a system that's got 10 forms when really it only started with like a few techniques. Wing Chun, I think, has probably been the best to keep it like, let's keep it simple, stupid. And you have uh, some good uh, teachers out there like Randy Williams. I know he's a controversial uh, Wing Chun guy where he's actually allowed some of that stuff. Like, what is my answer to being on the ground? Wing Chun has to have an answer to being on the ground because I'm sure they got knocked down to the ground when they were fighting back in the day. So what is the answer to that? Has it been lost? So I, I really think that that's a, a thing in martial arts today that's been lost is that how are we are we staying traditional this way or are we to the tradition of what the flavor, that would be a good word, what the flavor is of my teacher's teaching to be translated? Because again, when you were, when we're talking about, the, well, I'm not, you know, five foot four with a completely straight spine and can sit like this and be balanced. I have to have a 10 degree forward in order to keep my center of gravity between my feet. You know, I have to do that you know, because of my frame. So I have to adapt it to me. I can't adapt to something that doesn't fit my frame. Sounds good. Um, without the earbuds, the sound's cutting out again. So it looks like we'll just have to end the interview here. I'll stop the interview now, but we can keep talking yeah. afterwards. But um, for viewers, uh, this is Jerry from Fight Commentary Breakdowns, Fight Commentary Chats, and we have Shift with Scott Grady. So we'll bring Scott back because there's a lot to talk about, but got to figure out this audio situation in the future. So anyways, um, I'll stop recording now. We'll keep um, talking after this.